morning ladies welcome to women revealed so my name is andrea and i'm your mistress of ceremonies for this morning's event so i asked myself what's women revealed and i had inside information but i still ask myself as a woman what is it for me to be revealed and basically today what it is is we're having a conversation a she conversation about women yes different ages different groups different backgrounds yes but we all have one thing in common that we are believers in christ and we leave god to lead our way with everything so that is what women revealed is you might be going through something you might say something you might do something and you might say to yourself this isn't me how many of you have gone through that by hands I don't like the way I'm acting at the moment I don't like what I've just said you might have had an argument with somebody and you think oh wow why did I say that or what's up dreaded what's up you know when those fingers are working and you're upset and you fire off a message you're like why did I do that and there's some things come up, it could be friendships, it could be relationships, it could be work. Sometimes we need a place where we can speak as women about some things that we may not feel too comfortable to say to a friend, say to a family member, or say to somebody in our church. So that's why we're here for Women Revealed. Okay. So Proverbs 3 verse 15 states, She is more precious than rubies. And all things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. And I feel like as women, sometimes we forget how powerful we are. Sometimes we forget about the wisdom that is inside of us. And that is why we are here today. Yeah, to remind ourselves who we are. It's very important. So why women revealed? As I mentioned, a conversation needs to be had to put us back on track. Because sometimes we lose our way. Sometimes we don't even know what our way is. And we just need uh, you know, reassurance and reaffirmation that we are powerful beings. We are full of wisdom. And we can get what we need to do right. Okay. So, what are the outcomes of Women Revealed? I would ask, but for me, personally, I would like to leave here lighter. Now, some of you are wondering, lighter in what way? What way do you want to be lighter? Sometimes I'm burdened with things I don't even know I'm burdened with. I believe that when we have conversations here, and trust me, we are going to have a conversation here, and it's going to get quite deep, yeah, so be prepared. I want to come out here feeling lighter, yeah, with questions answered. And trust me, the questions will be answered, okay? Okay. Now, with all things, today would not have been possible without some of our amazing sponsors who are here today, um, this morning. So, firstly, I want to mention Slingstone Business Consulting. So, they're UK-based consultants specializing in business transformation advisory services with a mission to deliver solutions that align with their clients and strategy and business model. We also have Bite the Bits. So Bite the Bits are our technology sponsor, so responsible for everything, including our registrations and anything techie to do with today that is Bite the Bits. And then next we have Indigo Lifestyle. They are a Ghanaian lifestyle brand and they have luxury products. They're actually at the back um, of our room on the left so you know go and familiarize yourself with their products you will not be disappointed and then we also have a very special woman with us okay the name is very fitting her name is Rima King and she specializes in weight loss nutrition she's an advanced personal trainer she's a wellness life coach and corporate coach we also have Nyahu Clinic with us. Um, the importance um, of being healthy, treating ourselves well, Nyahu Clinic has this. And we want to thank Miss Elnora Aikweno. Okay, thank you very, very much. We want to give a special mention to VM Consult. VM Consult. And then we also have some wonderful women 
wonderful women who paid for a number of the young ladies to come here. So firstly, I want to mention a dear friend to me and to the first lady, Ms. Letitia Brown. Thank you very much. Letitia's here, paid for. Um, also, Laila Gawusubawa, thank you very much as well for your generosity. Um, Ama Pukuafeni, thank you very much as well for your generosity. Emmy Gold's Garden, thank you so much. Dorothy Abaka and Laura Tobunu. So I mentioned um, VM Consult. I would like to bring, invite um, Victoria Michaels. Father Lord, we thank you. We bless you. We give you praise. We honor you. We magnify your holy name for the gift of life, for the air that we breathe, for your goodness, your kindness, your love, your grace. We thank you for bringing us together into this room. It is not by accident. Father, we commit every activity that will be done in this house today into your care. Father, we pray that you come and take preeminence, take absolute control so that when we're done, we'll be careful to return all glory to your name. Thank you for answering us. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray with thanksgiving. And the powerful women in the house shall say, Amen. 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 So many, many years ago, this woman is at home with her husband, minding her own business. You know, like we women do, we mind our own business. And God said to her, my child, he said, yeah, I want to give you two gifts. And these gifts are children. So I'm going to give you two gifts. First one, come maybe two years or so, and give you another gift. So the first gift was a wonderful gift. And she said, oh God, thank you for my gift. But how can I, like, she's so wonderful. Goes, oh, wait till you see the second gift. And then the second gift came and she was like, wow. Now these two gifts are the gifts that keep giving. One of the first gifts was the lady of Revelation Church. And the second gift was Farida Bedway. So I want to say thank you and welcome to mummy, Mrs. <laughs> Lydia Bedway. Mrs. Lydia Bedway, want to acknowledge her. Now, before we start, let's have a little bit of an icebreaker. Now, I need a singer. When Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. When Jesus says yes, nobody, nobody can say no. Come on. When Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. Let's go. When Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. My mastermind behind this event, she is a business leader, okay, tax partner. Um, she is the president of the America. So there's so many accolades here. I'm just putting them in my head, you see? So she's also the president of the American Chamber of Commerce, Ghana. She is the board chair of the Palm Institute. She is a friend and sister, a mother to many. And she also is somebody who's very passionate about, passionate about the development of young people, of women, of entrepreneurs, of her fellow business owners. She's passionate about education. She's just a passion and she's, an, she's a light in a lot of our lives. Please, let's give a stand innovation and clap like you mean it for the first lady of the Revelation Church, Mrs. Aisha Bedway Ibe. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. You may be seated. Thank you all so much for coming. I mean, this in itself is a testimony because up until a week ago, there were only about 30 people registered. And I was praying and just asking God, will they show up, will they show up? And I had planned for 70 people. And as of today, we're exactly 70 people. So this is a testimony. And I'm so grateful to God for this opportunity to 
bring all of us here together to have this important discussion. It is my prayer that we'll leave here changed, experience healing, emotional healing, learn, grow, teach, and even share. So before we get into it, I want to say a few things. First of all, I want to acknowledge my husband, who's not here with us. This is just a girl's affair. But let's have a round of applause for Pastor Gabriel Ibe, who is my husband, he's my pastor, he's my best friend, and he supported me, encouraged me, and helped me plan this event down to the tiniest detail. And I tell you, it's wonderful to be married to somebody who supports you in every way and encourages you and empowers you to be your best. So let's just acknowledge him and give him another round of applause, please, because he's not here, but he'll watch the video. <laughs> So I want to tell us a little bit about the Revelation Church because this is a church-sponsored event. Women Reveals an expression of the Revelation Church. And the Revelation Church is just about a year old. My husband, Pastor Gabriel Ibe, is the founder. And as a church, we have a grace mandate. I just want to read it to you so that we are very, very clear. We are a group of transformed people compelled to showcase our lives as visible examples of how far the love of God can go for any man, irrespective of their background. And any man refers to men and women. So we, we are called to enrich, engineer, and empower the body of Christ by bringing her into the fullness of his finished work. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to enrich, engineer, and empower all of us here to bring us into the finished work of Christ. Amen. So whilst I was preparing for today, I was asking God for some foundational scriptures to set the tone. And I didn't know where it will come from. Sometimes God speaks to me through people. Sometimes he drops something in my spirit. And he gave me these passages, which I believe set the tone for what we're going to do today. And this actually came through my husband, who just randomly came to me and said, I want to share this with you. And I think it was highly appropriate for today. So it comes from the book of Ruth. Um, and I'll just refer us to some particular verses. So if we know a bit about Ruth, Ruth was Naomi's daughter-in-law. So Naomi was a lady from Bethlehem who was married to her husband, Elimelech. And because of famine, they left Bethlehem to go to Moab. And unfortunately, in Moab, Elimelech died. And 10 years later, their two sons also died. So as you can imagine, Naomi was a very, very sad person, drowning in grief. It was very difficult for her. She was a widow, and also she had lost her sons. And I can relate to Naomi because I was also a widow for 15 years. And it's not an easy thing to go through that kind of grief. And for Naomi, it was double because her sons had also gone. So in verse 4, of the book of Ruth, chapter 1. Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab and return to her homeland. So if you're going through something, you're trying to recover from some really tough blow life has given you, if you hear and know better, you need to rise up and move forward. Like Naomi did, you need that courage to say, enough is enough, it's time for me to move on. And that's what Naomi did. She heard that there was something better somewhere else, and she was ready to go. But she didn't go alone. She took her daughters-in-law. So when you know better, you should be ready to share with other people. Particularly for older women, we should be ready to share with younger women. Don't look at them in disdain or say, look at you, you're slim today, tomorrow you'll be fat like me, which are some of the comments that we hear. We see women competing negatively, challenging each other. Be ready to share and empower the women around you. On the way, Naomi asked her two daughters-in-law to go back to their mothers because she was probably thinking, I'm trying to find myself. Will I be able to support these women? But they vowed to go with her up until a particular point. And she actually blessed them. She said, may the Lord bless you with security of another marriage. So let's speak positive words to each other. Let's prophesy good things to each other. Yes, their husbands had died, her sons. But here she was wishing them better marriages in the future. Let's encourage each other to be better. Let's speak positive words to each other. Along the way, 
one of them decided to leave, and that was Opa. And she said, even though she didn't want to go, and even though she was sad, she decided to go back to her people and her gods. So if somebody cannot make the journey with you, because not everybody can go with you to where you are going, let them go. Let them go. Clearly, Opa was coming from a culture where they served other gods. Naomi was coming from a culture where they served the one true God. Eventually, it was going to be a problem, and they would be unequally yoked. So when somebody is no longer serving a place in your life and they need to go, let them go. But Ruth stayed. Ruth vowed to stay until death. And by staying, she was mentored by Naomi. She grew. She was taught. Naomi also was fulfilled that she had somebody who wanted to stay with her, someone she could support and pour into. And through that process, Ruth was able to get work to do by harvesting with the harvesters in the fields. And through that process, Naomi got to see Ruth as she really was, a kind person, a determined person, somebody who would never leave. In other words, Ruth was revealed, not only to the people around her, but more importantly to herself. When you are going through things, you actually get to know who you really are. As you evolve, you get to know that, wow, I didn't know I was that strong. I didn't know I could do this. So through this process, Ruth was revealed to herself. She was revealed to Naomi as a trustworthy, kind-hearted, determined person. She was revealed to the harvesters where she was gleaning as a hard-working, determined young lady. And then her reputation preceded her and she was revealed to Boaz, who eventually came and married her as her kinsman redeemer. So my prayer for us all today is that through sharing, teaching each other, learning, allowing the Holy Spirit to take control of the situation, open our minds to be able to receive, we will all become women revealed, just like Ruth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So now, I would like to introduce my guest, my guest of honor, and Michelle, I have to open the book because I have so much <laughs> to say about you. I don't want to miss anything. So I'm sure everybody knows Michelle McKinney-Hammond. Does everybody know Michelle? Yeah. Raise your hand if you know Michelle. Okay. But there's still some things I need to say about Michelle. So Michelle McKinney-Hammond, first of all, has many, many, many roles and wears many hats. But I'm going to start with the ones that um, I think really... Well, not in any order of importance, but the things that really touch me about you, Michelle. So, Michelle has written 40, over 40 books. Um, yeah, round of applause. I mean, even writing one book is a challenge. I've tried. It's not, I mean, I can't do it yet. But Michelle has written over 40 books. And she sold over 20 million copies of these books. Michelle is an international speaker, so she's spoken on many platforms around the world. She's also a relationship expert and a lifestyle coach. So anything to do with relationships, Michelle's your person. In fact, I read Michelle's first book when I was 24 years old, and I never knew that I'd meet her. But life has come full circle, and I'm glad we are here today. Re um, Michelle is also a singer and a songwriter and a producer and a TV host, and an actress. <laughs> and she's the pastor of Revel Relevance Music Ministry. She's also the president of MMH Ministry. So this is a woman in ministry, and I believe Michelle has been in ministry for more than 30 years, right, Michelle? 30 years in ministry. Um, there's so much more that I could say about Michelle, but I believe that as we have the conversation, it's going to come up. So I want us to, with a round of applause, welcome Michelle McKinney-Hammond. Michelle, we'll take our seats up here. So Michelle, it's um, wonderful to have you here. I think this is a very important conversation, and I'm glad that um, you're available to, for us to have that discussion. So Women Revealed, um, so much to talk about, but I think we'll jump right in. The theme of today is back to the garden, which is really talking about how a lot of the things that we do and behaviors that we exhibit 
can be traced back to the garden where Adam and Eve were. And I think it also helps us understand some of why, what, why we do what we do and how we can be better. Okay? So maybe I'll start with the issue of identity, which I think is a very important issue, particularly for women. Um, maybe just sharing a bit about myself. I was very fortunate to experience a lot of love from my parents, from my mother, and I know that love and affection makes children feel very secure. And so I always had a good sense of who I was, and also I had a connection with God. Yes, my relationship with God was not always as strong as it is now, but I always knew you know, who I was. And that is very important because challenges will come, particularly when it comes to relationships. It's always relationships that knock you off. But even when that happened, I always came back to my core. So why do you think identity is such a big issue for women in particular? Um, everything has an identity in life. If I pick this up, but what is this? Water. It's a bottle, right? So what is the bottle's job? To hold to water, water or to yeah. hold whatever is poured into it. So if I decide that, oh, I can use this as a hammer, what will happen? It so won't break, work, right? Yeah. Or we'll spoil the bottle or spill the contents. So identity is critical because it lets us know our function. And that is why identity is so important. Now we get identity from different things. Mm. Our parents name us. We know biblically that names were very, very important. Scientifically, it's been proven that when people are given weird names, that they um, have a tendency to lean towards juvenile delinquency and get in trouble. Really? Because, yeah, because they get teased for those names and it sets off a whole other direction of having to defend yourself when you shouldn't have to. Now, here in Ghana, we have different reasons we're named. I was named after my grandmother, who's actually part Nigerian. So my, oh, my name was, uh, yes. Ayodele. Yes, so that's where Ayodele comes from. And Ayodele means joy arrives in the home. Now my mother named me Michelle, which I think was a prophetic name because it means who is like God, one who stands behind and practices absolute truth. And that is my character. That is who I am. I live and breathe that every day. And every time you say my name, Michelle, you're confessing over me who I am and what my function is. So names are very, very critical. Um, and that's why God selected names in the Bible for people. Mm. And now he uses your parents to select names for you. Now, the other thing that gives us our identity is experiences that we have. Um, some of those can be good, some of those can be bad. And if we buy into the lie that that bad experience is who we are, we begin to align ourselves with that identity, mm. right? Yeah. And then what people say about us becomes another thing that sometimes we need to fight mm -hmm. and sometimes we need to embrace. So we have all these external things. And now we've got social media, oh my God. I'm sorry, I'm so over social media these days. Anybody here, can you get a witness? Yes. I'm tired, they have worn me out. Someone said, when are you gonna do a live again? I said, I am tired. It's too much. Mm. You know, even for someone like me who's accomplished, sometimes I get on there and I see my peers doing things and I'm like, oh, I haven't done that. What's wrong with me? I'm not doing enough. So how do we find our true identity we have to go back to the one who made us. And he's already completed his plan in his mind for you. So he is the one who gives us our true identity. And at the end of the day, after all the other voices speak and prod and cajole us and even challenge us in who we are, we have to go back to the one who made us and say, God, in your eyes, who am I? Yes. And I think that is also very comforting when we feel disconnected. Yes. Do you remember what Christ did for us? Mm -hmm. Essentially, apart from the names that our parents gave us, our name is priceless. Yes. Because we were worth the price. We were worth the death of Jesus Christ. We are valuable. We are precious. And we need to remind ourselves of these facts stated in the Bible. As, you know, because it's, it's, the world will you know, throw you all over the place. And that's why we have to keep connected to our source. Yes. In fact, what you said about social media is quite um, 
quite important because in the last couple of days, I was reading that one of the models, I think uh, Bella Hadid, just you know has just had a mental breakdown and it's because of social media and she can't do it anymore mm -hmm. so it really does tear us apart and it's important for us to be connected to the source of our creation to be able to come back to our center and remember who we are because like you said if we remember who we are we will not accept certain behavior certain treatment particularly in relationships which is where we are going to go next because that is where women get yes um, I lived in America for many years, and they had this thing called hitchhiking. I don't think they do it that much anymore because it's now dangerous. But at the time, um, if you needed a ride and you didn't have transport, you could stand on the side of the road and stick your thumb out. And cars would come by, they would stop and say, where are you going? And if you said, oh, I'm going to cantonments, they'd say, oh, I'm going that way, hop in. And you could get a free ride to cantonments. But if they stopped and said, uh, I'm going to cantonments. They said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to East Legon. Then you knew not to get in that car because it's not going in the direction that you want to go. When our identity is intact, our choices begin to align with who we are. So that any choice that is not conducive to who we are, we don't accept that invitation or that challenge. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's very, very important to have a, a solid sense of who you are and why am I here? You know, and, and the thing is, I don't want you to get hung up on huge platforms as purpose because every single person in the room is on purpose and in purpose every single day. You were made and created to touch who you touch. And then collectively, it creates what God wants the kingdom to look like. So it's not a matter of if you've got 24 followers versus 3,000 followers. What are you doing with those 24 lives? How are you impacting them? Because one of them could be the one that ends up with a million followers and, and is that way because of what you impacted in them. So we are all here. To, you know, I always say Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks is the woman who refused to give up her seat on the bus in America, if you don't know who she is. And it started the whole civil rights movement. One little insignificant thing, seemingly insignificant. She was just tired. It wasn't, she wasn't fighting. She wasn't doing civil rights that day. They just told her to get it, but she was just tired. And she said no. And it sparked an entire movement. So you never know that when you hit that aha moment. But if you're true to your identity, my identity, Tega will tell you, my, my daughter here, she says, you can't help yourself. You just have to get in people's business. <laughs> Because I don't like to see anything wrong. If, I, if you're a stranger and I see you walking down the street looking crazy, I'm going to come up to you and say, why are you wearing that? Don't you know that you're worth more than that? That you're greater and bigger? And she'll go, don't do that. It's who I am. I can't help myself. So now if you put me in a forum where I can't speak, it's not the place for me to be. Yeah. It's not who I'm called and created to be. So knowing your identity gives you your sense of purpose and it helps you make choices, life choices that align with that. I just felt it was important well, to put it's that. Great. It's great because again, this, this comes directly into our relationship choices, mm -hmm. the people we choose to spend our time with yes. and our life with. And there was a concept I came up, uh, sorry, came across in one of your books um, called Adam is Asleep. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let me just share my experience with Adam being asleep. Okay, so as I shared um, earlier, I was a widow for 15 years. My first husband passed away uh, when my daughter was a baby, and um, I had to now start dating again, which I didn't know how to do because I hadn't done it uh, before, mm -hmm. right? So um, I was just very frustrated because you know, you go on dates with, with men, and then they seem interested and they just vanish, or they ghost you, yeah. or they, they, uh, they, they can't speak clearly about their feelings and you are confused and it's particularly painful when you have over invested in the relationship mm -hmm. and by over invested I mean giving more of your emotional attention that you should giving them sex when you shouldn't and so here you are bound and expecting more and mm -hmm. they're not ready to give more and this was very very confusing and frustrating for me but like I said I mean along the line when I just decided to focus on God 
a lot of these things came to me by revelation. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the men themselves, they're trying to figure it out themselves. Yeah. They need time to be sure. And women often, we get it quickly. We know who we want to be with. Mm -hmm. But they don't know. It takes them some time. Mm -hmm. And you can give them the time when you haven't overinvested. Mm -hmm. You can take your time. You can say, okay, you can date other people in the true sense of dating, i.e. going on dates. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I read um, that concept in your book, Adam is Asleep, it made so much sense. Yeah. Maybe you can speak about that for the benefit of the ladies. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, my mentor, Bunny Wilson, told me that a man is constructed in such a way that his hormones give him an alarm like every 72 hours. <laughs> Get up and go find your mate. <laughs> their their, their uh, testosterone rises, you know, and it, it puts them in, in hunt mode. Now what happens is women give too much at that point and they go back to sleep. The urgency is now gone for finding their permanent partner. Because, as your mother would say, why buy the cow if you can get the milk for free? That's not just talking about physically. It's talking about emotionally and spiritually as well. Uh -huh. uh, you know, there are lots of men who have friends with different types of benefits, not always sexual, sometimes emotional, mm -hmm. sometimes housekeeping, yes. sometimes you're the cook. You're the wife before you are the wife. Yeah. And so what it does is it puts them back to sleep. You see? Now God wants them to sleep and then present you, wake them up, and they should immediately recognize who you are because he's put that instinct in the man. But when you go and announce who you are, Eve didn't say anything. <coughs> she didn't uh, hit Adam and say, get up, Adam, I'm your wife. God said so. God told me you're my husband. She didn't say that. <laughs> and that's yeah. the biggest deception in the church today. Yeah. There's always some woman who's running around saying, God told me so-and-so is my husband. He's not paying you any attention. As a matter of fact, he's even dating someone else. He finally mm -hmm. marries that person, and then you say God lied to you. God didn't lie to you. Your emotions attached yourself to that person, yeah. and the enemy whispered in your ear. That's what happened. Okay, the enemy will align himself and agree with your desires if they are not under the submission to God. So now you also have to know that you have to guard your ear gates and your eye gates. Because uh, Tega and I were having this conversation on the way here. I have a client who um, there was a guy in her life that she liked. Okay. Okay. And he would say little things. I like, you know, how men drop, drop crumbs, hints. Yes. you know, and, and they know it. They know how to titillate you and tickle your ears. You know, it says in uh, Timothy that these are the type that worm their, their way into the homes of foolish women. Mm -hmm. Don't be a foolish woman. If the flirt is not followed by pursuit, it's just a flirt. Let me say that again. If the flirt is not followed by intentional pursuit, it's just an unintentional flirt. Yep. Don't get excited. As a matter of fact, you should be a little annoyed. Because yep. someone does not understand your value and is playing with you or mm -hmm. attempting to play with you. Mm -hmm. But you're bigger than that. You're a wise woman, so you recognize it and you go, silly boy, when you're serious, <laughs> call me. Exactly. You see? So there's a difference there. So Adam is asleep. Sometimes Adam is asleep on purpose. I'm just going to say it. Yeah. He's asleep because he can be asleep. Men will do what they can do, what you allow them to do. Mm -hmm. And I love men, so this is not a man bashing session. Not at all. I, you know, I really feel, I feel bad for men because women have ruined them. It's not that men are bad. It's, you know, it's like I have three dogs. Aisha knows them well. Yes. She comes to the house. Simba. And is, you know, and they always say that it's not the dog that's wrong. It's the owner. The owner must be trained. Mm -hmm. And so it is that women teach men how to treat us by how we treat one another yep. and how we allow them to treat us. So you have to have, once again, your identity intact, know your value, Know what you will and will not allow. I don't allow men to call me after 10 p.m. at night. After that, it's a booty call. And I'm not doing the booty. Yep. Hello, we're going to be real today. So don't, yes. don't sit there and be religious with me. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> this is this is the real world that we live in. We are spirit, soul, body. Yes. God knows that we have three layers. He does not ignore either layer. Okay. So when I, I say things, don't be shocked and rocked. This is the real world we live in. And plus, you talk about it when you're not here anyway. Mm -hmm. Let's face it. So, yeah. yeah. Adam is asleep. I like what you said about the fact that it's not just about the physical overinvestment. What I actually did find it was the emotional, emotional investment. Because they will take what you give them. So the mm -hmm. fact that, you know, when you even sit down and have a conversation with a guy in your life who is not someone you're in a serious relationship with, they are dumping their brain on you. It's a brain dump. Mm -hmm. They will talk and talk and talk and you give them ideas. You are investing in them. Mm -hmm. You are listening to them. You are giving them attention that they do not deserve because mm -hmm. you don't have that bond or relationship with right. them. It's, it, and that is where we now start to feel that, oh, I must be special mm -hmm. because he's listening to me mm -hmm. and I'm the one he keeps coming he's to. He's gathering yes, information. Yes, he's coming to me for this type of nurturing mm -hmm. that he's going to have for A that type, type of nurturing. And yeah. he will keep going. Yeah. Until he decides the person who he wants to be with. And it will not be any of us. Exactly. <laughs> it will be, be the one who has kept herself, who put boundaries and said, no, you're not, you're not, you're not my, my who, person. Who offers a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Because there's the hunter in the, in the heart of every man. And so an easy trophy is not thrilling. Mm. It, doesn't, it does not get them the, 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 the uh, dopamine rush that they're looking for yeah and, and so they've got to know that they've captured a prize mm -hmm. you see and so there has to be just a slight bit of tension you know um yes you should be open so they don't fear approaching you you should um be vulnerable enough for them to know that they can ask but then they also need to know that they need to work for you exactly you know jacob worked seven years for, for rachel. rachel and then worked another, another seven. seven why Ah, because and Rachel was are, worth it. The minute they call and say, "Hey, you look nice," ah! <laughs> really? <laughs> are you that starved? No. You're not starved. You're not love starved. You are loved with an everlasting love by the one who created you and knows Amen. you intimately. Amen. And as you're passionate in your relationship with him, you're already full. So you already have the glow of love on your face, which attracts the love that you want. But if you're love starved. You attract a predator, not a lover. Yep. I think that, that deserves a round of applause, Michelle. So maybe at this point, we can, I think the Q&A should be open. You can start posting your questions, but I will allow some, you know, if, for those who want to ask questions real time, we will take that. Mm -hmm. But we'll, we'll just go on a little bit, Michelle. So I think this leads nicely into the discussion about enabling behavior. And mm -hmm. this is a favorite of mine which is particularly prevalent amongst married women. Mm. Mm -hmm. So this is when we over assist our men. Yes. We over help them. We actually do things that are their responsibility to do mm -hmm. to the point that they actually cede their position to us. Yes. And then we complain to our friends and our sisters that ah, I'm the one doing everything in this household. I'm the one paying all the bills. I'm the one doing, he doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. I have to change all the light bulbs. I have to do all of this. He's not helping me. He's not helping me. But how did we get here? Mm -hmm. One of the things that my mom has always teased me about is I'm quick to say, this is not my responsibility. This is not my responsibility. Yeah. I know what is my responsibility. Even outside of my marriage, even with friends and even male friends who, you know, we don't roll like that. There mm -hmm. is distance. The minute he's calling me to say, oh, I have, I'm like, no, no, no. I, I don't have time to listen to you because it's mm. not my responsibility. Right. Find the person whose responsibility it is to listen to you because I don't it's have true. enough time. We can be doing, oh, how are you? Blah, 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 blah. Particularly my male friends who are married, especially when I wasn't married, I kept a lot of distance because I don't want their wives to feel mm -hmm. any kind of way. Yeah. So when they would call and say, it's a long time, how are you? Even if we grew up together, oh, I'm good. How are the children? How's your wife? We keep it light. Yeah. Because I have nothing to prove, as some of us do, like, oh, we've been friends since we were five, and what does she... No, 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 yeah. she's his wife. Yeah. So let there be respectful distance, and I exactly. keep away from them. So if he wants to talk to me about something, I'll be like, oh, but what does your wife think about? I think you need to discuss it with her, because mm -hmm. this is not my responsibility. Thank you. Just like in my house, it's not my responsibility to call the plumber, the electrician. Right. I don't deal... That's not my responsibility. Mm -hmm. I don't deal with... I don't fix things in the house. Yeah. I don't deal with that. It is my husband's responsibility. Exactly. Let us have the lines very clear. Yeah. Because if I start to do those things, 
it will become my job. Yeah. And I will start to resent him mm -hmm. that how come I'm the one doing everything? Because right. this is what women do. We yes. like to nurture. Oh, let me help him. Oh, he doesn't have money to pay the children's school fees and the mm -hmm. rent. The next thing you know, you are the one paying the rent. And there are too many women who I have had discussions with about these things yes. that I know it's a problem in Ghana today, mm -hmm. especially, well, not just Ghana, but it's a problem in in, you know, in married, in, in marriage. Marriages. But it starts in, in single. It starts when they're single. Mm -hmm. And I think you gave the example about women who put their, hus or put their boyfriends or their husbands through medical school, they pay his fees. And when he graduates, he goes to marry somebody else. Yes. You don't understand it. Oh, but I was there the whole time. I paid for everything. Why mm -hmm. did he leave? Mm -hmm. Michelle, <laughs> tell us. He <laughs> left because you're a reminder of who he wasn't. Mm. And at some point, you also probably are now not willing to give control up because you had it the whole time when you were helping him. So now he's battling for the respect that he always wanted, but couldn't have before and knew it. And now he's moved into this new place, but you haven't shifted. You, you're still being who you are because yeah. you were in control before. But this thing starts even as singles. Yes, it does. You know, it does. Um, because you, what you're doing is you're auditioning to become a wife. You should yep. have to audition to be a wife. It's an audition, exactly. You want to be the special one. I want to prove to him that exactly. I'm the one I'm who should the marry. one who can fill your needs, baby. No, 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 no. You know what? It's already the instinct is built into him to know and recognize his wife. When Adam woke up out of his sleep, he said, you are bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Yeah. He had just finished naming all the animals and knew that none of them was his partner. So let them finish naming all the animals. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then when they get to you, they should be in hot pursuit. They know what they want. They're coming after you. And it's just your job to look cute, bat your eyelashes, and say, oh, I'm thinking about it. Yep. In the meantime, ask God to reveal who this person is yeah, before you get important. excited. I'll tell you a story. Mm. There was a guy that was pursuing me and everyone was excited for me because he was handsome, he was fine, you know? Yeah, very fine. Very fine. Yes. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dressed nice, smelled good, talked the talk, did all the right things, was just woo wooing and pursuing me. Everyone was like, woo, woo, woo. And for some reason I was like, and I was like, God, what is wrong with me? Am I emotionally dead? What's happening here? Why am I not, you know, responding to this guy? Can you just reveal to me who he really is? Because when that happens, I know the Holy Spirit's telling me something. Sure enough, the Holy Spirit said, call so-and-so. When I called this person, mm. and I said, I didn't say that the guy was, was pursuing me or anything. I said I was working on a project with the guy. The minute I said that, ah, watch yourself. Ah, do you know about this guy, blah, blah, blah? Yeah. They had a whole list of things. Whoa. I said, well, maybe she's just better because she knew him. Yeah. So <laughs> the Holy Spirit said, call so-and-so. I mentioned in a text, I said, I'm working on a project with so-and-so. The person said, I will call you. I said, hey, ooh, danger, hey, danger. Hey. <laughs> they called and said, be careful, oh. Blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, that's it, done. The Holy Spirit will reveal a person oh, to you, yes. will reveal the intentions of their heart before you even allow yourself to get excited. Check in with the Holy Spirit and say, tell me about this person. You want a private investigator? It's the Holy Ghost. Oh, yes. He will tell you, he will read you the mail on that person to let you know if you should get excited or not. Yes. Now, if you get permission to be excited, you're still cool and excited. Mm -hmm. You're not going overboard. Remember, you are not auditioning to be a wife. Please don't audition to be a wife. You already are a wife. Let that sink in for exactly. a minute. If God has chosen marriage as your portion, you are already a wife. And in the fullness of time, he will present you to the one who will recognize you as such and treat you as such. Now, we talk about dating. Dating is not for mating. It is yeah. for collecting data. It's data collection. That's what it is. It's data collection. You are collecting information to see if this per person is worthy of being considered for courtship, which is another level before covenant. Okay? Even in courtship, they can be dismissed if they're not doing the right thing. Yep. Now, if you get to that part and they don't feel that they should be living up to who they've been called to be as a man, 
then that's not going to get better if you marry them. We are under this uh, misassumption that, you know, you can work with the guy, you can change the guy, you can mold him. He's not a builder bear Yep. Okay, he is who he is. And you've got to decide, is he a partner? Does he have potential? Or is he a problem in a project? Mm -hmm. We don't need problems in projects. Nope. We're looking for a partner. After 20, you don't even want potential. Because they should already know who they are, have a vision for their lives, to be able to explain that clearly and be actively pursuing that thing to, to show you that they're worth their weight in gold. Mm. And they should be stepping up to the plate. And if they don't, you step back and allow them. May I highlight Deborah? Yes. Deborah was a judge in Israel. But Deborah wasn't fighting anybody's battles for Israel. No. She knew that was the man's job, a la Pastor Aisha. <laughs> she knew her lane and she stayed in it. Barack said he was not going to go and fight without her. She says, okay, I'll go with you. But she went to the battle line yeah. and she said, take it away, baby. <laughs> You're on your own now, okay? And Barack went and fought and she had warned him ahead of time that the victory would be given to a woman because yep. she went with him. He said he didn't mind. mind. But she was still careful to give him props yeah. at the end. Mm -hmm. So she didn't kill his ego. She didn't deflate him in any way. She supported and she released. And that's what women are supposed to do. Support and release. release. Support and release. Support him. Speak into him. Prophesy over him. And then release him to be the man that God called and created him to be. Yep. Let me tell you, women are very... <laughs> I hope women are very notes. responsible for men's manhood. It starts from motherhood. You should be raising your son to be with another woman, not making him a substitute husband if you're not getting what you want from your husband. Mm -hmm. That's what a lot of women do with their sons. Yes. They make them, you know, surrogate husbands. Mm -hmm. And it's wrong because then when you release them to their wife, they don't know what to do. And they're used to being pampered and spoiled and not... Um, you know, living up to who that men are great. Let me tell you, when a man steps into his full manhood, it's an awesome wonder to behold. Yes. And you should have the pleasure of seeing that and being able to praise him for being the man God created him to be. Not dummying him down and emasculating him and taking away all his instincts to be who he was created to be. And so the lines have to be drawn. You must know your position. Mm -hmm. You must know as a partner that you hand the ball. Any team that plays a game, everyone knows their position. position yeah. The forward is not going to do the guard's work. The guard is not going to be a forward. The one that runs the ball is the only one that's going to run the ball. Even if somebody's in position to do it, what do they do? They pass, pass it, it off to the person that's supposed to do it. And that's how the game is won. And it's about winning the game mutually not individually. Mm -hmm. So stop filling in the gaps. Oh, he doesn't have the money, so I'll do it. No. Wait. Wait. He will find a be way to do it. Be uncomfortable for a while. Let, and him, let do him do it. it. Yeah. And he'll be so proud of himself when he does it. And then you say, baby, you did that. High five. <laughs> and then you know what that does? It makes him look for another reason to make you praise him. Mm -hmm. So we've got this thing backwards. Let's stop putting stilts under them and allow them to stand and be who they were created to be. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That's, that was powerful because I think it's so important that we, we, we deal with that issue. Mm -hmm. um, and when you, when you were telling us about the story about the guy, I mean, I had a similar experience uh -huh. where there was this guy who was pursuing me. The guy actually, this is like maybe 12 years ago, the guy actually got on a plane from Nigeria and came here for a date. Mm -hmm. And my friends were like, oh, wow, you're so lucky. This guy actually got on a plane for you. But, you know, I wasn't feeling anything. I didn't understand. I'm like, is there something wrong with me? So when you said that, I connected immediately. Is there something wrong? Why am I not, you know, feeling anything? We should he checked, he checked all the boxes. He was yeah. tall. He was good looking. He had his own company. He had money. You know, my friends were like, Charlie, aren't you, like, aren't you moved? I was just like, what's going on? Then one day, I was like, you know, the guy actually went back and said, so you are not, like, you know, you are not connecting with me. I said, oh, you know, we just need some time. Now, one day, I was lying down, and I heard this audible voice say, there is a way that seems right to man. That is wrong. Mm -hmm. to, that leads to destruction. Yeah. And, you know, I wasn't even, those times, God and I were not very tight. Like, mm -hmm. we were okay, but we're not, like, mm -hmm. the way we are now. <laughs> yeah. So... 
you know, I, I didn't even know what Bible verse it was. I just heard it. Mm -hmm. And I just knew I had to just cut it, mm -hmm. cut it off, just end it there. You know, so it is very true that the Holy Spirit will reveal people to you. All you have to do is ask. Mm -hmm. And that guy went on to marry somebody, called me four years later and said, but why didn't you like me? I liked you so much. And I said, I don't know why I didn't like you, but clearly I'm not the one, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I, I hope you also get married because he was also a widower and I was a widow. So it was like, this mm -hmm. makes sense, but it just wasn't happening. Yeah. You know, he said, well, I hope you also find the love that you're looking for. Like he was saying it with attitude. I'm like, mm, I'm sure I will. Just like, <laughs> just like you found yours, you know? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I heard that voice and I knew this was, and that's why there was no connection. Mm -hmm. So it seems right to everybody, but it's not right for you. So I think it's very important to have that connection with God. Mm -hmm. Ask him whether, first of all, marriage is your portion. And once he confirms that, let the person come and be ready. And mm -hmm. when the person comes, that's just the start of another journey. Mm -hmm. When I met my husband, that was just the start. Now, yeah. God, is he the one? Show me. Show me his character. Yeah. Me his... I don't want to go and ask people. I don't want to be a private investigator. Mm -hmm. I want you to show me. Yeah. And I got my confirmations. Mm -hmm. And I was able to give him time to get his confirmations because I was not over-invested. Yeah. And I lived very much in the present because mm -hmm. I was grateful for every day. And I used to say this, that he didn't like it. I used to say, I'm so grateful for you. Gabriel, that if it ended today, I would be grateful. Mm -hmm. No regrets. He's like, it's not going to end today. I'm like, yeah, but if it did, I'd be happy. Yeah. Like, I have nothing bad to say. Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed our friendship to this point. Mm -hmm. I have felt secure. I have felt affirmed. You have told me how you feel about me. I know where we are going. So if it turns out that this is not it, I'm still grateful. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was just one of the many confirmations I got from God that this is it. Yeah. We're There'll supposed be a to peace. live in the present. There was peace. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it's so wonderful when you're able to do things God's way. You have peace in your relationship, and then you have peace in your marriage mm -hmm. as well. So that's really, really and, and important. And I want to interject here because mm -hmm. I think there's a very important thing that you, you sparked me when you said it. Yes. Sometimes there's nothing wrong with the relationship. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. Sometimes it's not about the relationship. It's about purpose. Yeah. God does everything on purpose with a purpose in mind. Now we as Ghanaians, Nigerians, Africans in this room, we are pressured to be married all the time. Not out of God's purpose and design, no. but out of culture and tradition. Yeah. God supersedes culture and tradition. Culture comes from the word cult. It is a mode of thinking of a certain sect of people that they've decided this is how life should go. God is bigger than culture. He is bigger than tradition. He created marriage for a purpose. Now, the, the person was right, seemed right, checked all the boxes, but he wasn't in purpose. Pastor Gabriel was in purpose, and all the boxes got checked again. Many times, if you're desperate, I always say desperation diminishes discernment. Mm. The enemy will give you someone that checks all the boxes. The counterfeit. That's the a counterfeit. counterfeit. Yeah. Before the true thing comes along. And you've got to be plugged into God. You've got to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit to be able to discern that, yes, this guy would be a nice partner, but he will not align with my purpose. I had a situation like that. There was a guy I was desperately in love with. Oh! <laughs> I can feel the desperation. You can feel it. I can it. feel it. <laughs> I was so in love with this guy. And we had such a great relationship. We made everyone just sick. But can I? They were like just tired of us. Like the minute we walked in the room, they were just tired because we were like, ah. You know, it was everything you wanted, you know? It didn't work. And he went off. He married someone else. And I was shattered. Mm. I mean shattered. Okay? It, it didn't work. And his parting words to me was, he, we went off and he got someone pregnant. Mm. Okay? Because I wouldn't sleep with him. And so then he decided he had to marry the person because he didn't want to be an absentee father. Mm. So his parting words to me were, well, I like her. I, I love you. I love you. I like her, and I don't want to be an absentee father. And I said, 
listen to what you're saying. This is not going to work. But in the meantime, if you choose to marry her, you must never, ever call me again. Yeah. Because it's not going to work, and I don't want my name to be in the middle of it when it falls apart. So sure enough, he married her, and I was just, ugh, I was just dragging on the floor. Y'all would have said, Michelle, you're so pitiful. Woman of God, get up. <laughs> <laughs> I was so pitiful. Pitiful. Well, they got a divorce, and he came back. Mm. Guess what? He married someone else again. Ooh. I said, God, what is it? <laughs> I mean, because we would always have such a great time together. We work together. We won awards together. Doesn't that seem like that would be the perfect fit? Yeah. God spoke to me one day and said, there was nothing wrong with your relationship, but you would not be doing any of the things you're doing now if I allowed you to marry him. Mm. That made my blood run cold. Mm. Many years later, he came and said, I'm still in love with you. I said, oh I'm fine gosh. with not being with you. <laughs> I'm really, really fine. And I said to him, I said, God told me I couldn't marry you because if I had married you, I wouldn't be doing any of the things I'm doing now. Now, let's think about the scope of that. No 42 books. Yes. No um, going all over the world talking for God. And at some point, I would have resented him. Yeah, well, that's a test because the faith part is the hard part. And it's the, the hard waiting part. part is the hard part. We settle because we don't think yes. we have options. Yeah. But that's really kind of insulting to God, don't you think? Mm. He's only got one guy? Really? In this whole world that he created? Yeah. So think about that. The waiting is hard. I mean, I had to wait 15 and a half years. Mm -hmm. It's hard, but it's worth it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's worth it. But uh, I like what you said, and I think a lot of us can identify with that. Don't you just hate it when the guy from 20 years ago comes and says, oh, I always liked you when we were growing up, it happens but I never said it. Or the ex that when you were 25, he comes now, he's 40. You know, I, I, I married the wrong woman. It's always been you. It's always been you. Or he's somewhere, mm -hmm. not committing to you, calls you like once in three months. Yes. You know I've always loved you. It is so annoying. It's cut very it off. annoying. Just cut it off because they're trying to string you along mm -hmm. and you don't need any of that. Right. I have a question that I think would be... Oh, actually, yes. I have to finish the sentence okay. on that. When I told him yes. that um, God <laughs> told me I wouldn't be doing it, he said, that's not true. And then he stopped. And he said, well, maybe it would be true, but I would have been better with you. Uh -huh. You see, men Selfishness. are very transactional. Mm, when they choose you, they do a lot of calculations. What is this woman bringing to my life? Exactly. How is she going to add to what I'm trying to do? Mm -hmm. They are very transactional. Women are not transactional. We need to be. We need to be. We need to manage our emotions better. Yes. And my experience is that when you allow God to lead you. Your emotions don't control you. You can yes. actually see clearly. You are not blinded by anything mm -hmm. and you can choose because men, they choose and yeah. they choose well. But actually we are the ones who have the power to choose the people we end up with. Mm -hmm. So if you don't choose well, you're going to have issues. Yes. There's a question that has come through on Slido that I think you'd be the best person to answer this question. So okay. the lady says, I like the way you said, if God has ordained you to be a wife, how do you deal with not being a wife when it is a general expectation? So, Michelle, you are not a wife. Uh -huh. Michelle is a relationship expert. She's been in ministry over 30 years. She is wise. She's experienced. God has revealed many things to her, but she has never been married, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe you can answer that question. How do you deal with it when God has not ordained you to be a wife when everybody around you expects marriage? Well, first, I'm going to examine your question. How do you know you've not been ordained to be a wife? And it's true. Everyone is not ordained to be a wife. But if you're not ordained to be a wife, you wouldn't ask me that question, actually, because it would be okay with you. God would give you a peace and a fulfillment in the state that you're in. Mm. Usually what happens is we put a clock on the mantle of our heart, of our expectation of when God should fulfill the mandate for us to be married. Mm. God is God is definitely an African man who <laughs> he is not interested in time at all yeah he lives outside of time he, he lives, lives outside, outside of, of time. time time is a man-made device to set boundaries on God's infinite space that's why a day to him is as a thousand mm. he's not so interested in when you get married 
He's interested in why you get married. You see? So for him, it's all about, remember I said it's attached to purpose. And if you have not hit the X marks the spot in the spirit for the purpose for you to be attached to someone else, because God attaches you to someone else when you will be more effective with someone than without. God is waiting for some of you to be effective now. Because if you don't set it in place now, it will never happen. How you start is how, how you, you mean finish. To go on, yeah. If you're waiting for a marriage and a man to make life happen for you, you will end up making the wrong choice and being very unhappy. Because that person will never be able to live up to your expectations because you will have the wrong ones. You will give him a job that is not his to do. Okay? So it's very, very important that while you wait, wait is not um, a passive act. Mm. It's an aggressive position of when you wait tables, you're moving, you're serving. Yeah. Find someone to serve. Practice service now. Okay, because a lot of us are sitting around waiting for someone to come and make life happen. <laughs> yes. And when it happens, it won't be what you expected. And you'll mess it up because you haven't, a practice, you haven't put into practice any of the things that you would need to be able to do. Can you make a home? Are you a good cook? Are you taking good self-care of yourself mm. so that you're desirable? Hello. If you want a six-pack, then you need to have a six-pack. You will attract what you are. Yeah. Okay? So all of these things need to be in place. And God uses the time of waiting to develop you and teach you to serve. And when those things are in place, if you look at Rachel, Rachel yeah. was found working. She was found serving. It's very interesting that women were continuously found in action. Yes, and Ruth, Ruth as well. was gleaning yeah. in the field. Yeah. Everyone was doing something, okay? When the man spotted them, they were not inactive, you know, waiting for them to come and buy them a purse. No. Okay, so it's very important for you to say, God, what am I supposed to be doing with my time? And when the questions come and Auntie says, my friend, when are you getting married? Oh? You say, when God says so, and until then, I am content. Yeah. You see, they can see your misery and they play on it. Mm -hmm. So it's up to you to have a full, <coughs> fulfilled life so they can't argue with your status. Exactly. Thank you, Michelle. So there were actually a few questions. Yes, let's round of applause. There were actually a few questions around that. And I think, you know, somebody actually said, are there women who marriage isn't their purpose? Yes, there's one right here. Yeah. And if that's the case, how do they manage without a companion mm -hmm. or children? Mm -hmm. How do they manage the society? So Michelle, how have you married, ma managed without a companion or biological children? The Bible says, single barren woman, for many more children will you have than she who has a husband. Mm. And that is very true. You know, I was teasing my driver on the way here, and I said, oh, Sally, you're my surrogate husband. <laughs> you know, because he's been with my family since what? Did he say 1990? 29 years. 29 years he's been with my family. And when, when my father passed on and I moved to Ghana, he said, I will stay with you and I will never leave you. Wow. And he takes care of everything around my house. I also have a, a son that God has given me who lives in my house. He takes care of all, all my things. Mm. He's given me a daughter. He's given me Tega, who just pushes me up the hey, hill. Hey, Tega. All his, Wait, all let everybody see you. All my pictures on social media, videos. She's responsible. I wouldn't do any of it if she wasn't. Thank you, Tega. Thank you. I'm so grateful for her, and she's always speaking into my life. Mm. She's such an encourager. She keeps me young. She keeps me laughing. Mm. She's a gift from God to me, and I have other daughters and other sons. So God always fills the gap. He will not allow you to be in a state of want for anything. Yep. But you have to be open to how he does that. If you insist that it must come this way, it becomes an idol in your life. Yeah. As Jonah said, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. It means you miss the other opportunities that God puts in your life, the other people he puts in your life, the other things he puts in your life to shore you up and to fill those spaces until he produces something else for you. Yes. Embrace the season you're in. 
nurture an attitude of gratitude and ask him to open your eyes to see the things he's put in your life to fill those spaces. Yes. He will not leave you wanting. Now, I had an aunt who got married for the first time at 67 years old. Wow. She Amazing. said it was worth the wait. And we had to talk her into it. She was having <laughs> so much fun. I said, please put this man out of his misery and marry him. He's miserable. He wants to marry. She says, oh, but wow, I'm having such a good time. I said, you can have a better time. Please marry the guy. You know, and so she did. And they were both retired. They went to dancing lessons twice a week. They went on cruises around the world. They were both retired. And they had a blast. And she said it was worth the wait until she went home. She had 20-something years of marriage before she went home to be with the Lord. Wow. So, you know, life doesn't end at 30, oh. No. It doesn't end at 35. Oh, I get letters all the time. I'm, I'm 25 and I'm not married. I'm like, child, you're still a chicken with feathers. You, didn't, you haven't even gotten started. And you don't even know who you are till you're 40. Seriously. Mm. I, I, I'll be 65. I'm, I'm on my way. Woo! And you look amazing. You don't look a day over. With all 95. the young boys chasing me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, all, all of that to say, that life, come on guys, life is never over till it's over. Yeah. And then it's still not over because you go to a new life. Yes. So all this thing we do with death, please get over it. Those people are having a better time than you. That's true. You should be jealous, not sad. Yes. Okay? Yes. So all I'm saying is that life evolves. It does. And it gets better and better. And especially as women, I'm just going to tell you that you think you've lived a... When you get older and you really know who you are and you come into that, I don't care, this is who I am. Oh my God, it is so good. So there's a lot to look forward to. So don't, don't, you know, don't let people rush you and get you hung up with the wrong person. You've got time to find the right one. No, to be found by the right one. Yes, thank you, that's amazing. There's a round of applause, please. And obviously you've taken very good, look, good care of yourself because you oh, don't yes. look a day over 35. Oh, thank you, darling. We see your lashes, we see, your, we see the glow, you look amazing. So there's a couple of questions. I think I'll take this one and maybe Michelle, you can chip in. So somebody says, first of all, how do we know whether we are ordained to be a wife or not? And then how do you date intentionally after heartbreak? Okay, so how do you know whether we are ordained to be a wife or not? You need to go to God. So like I shared, when my first husband died when I was 28 years old and I had a, my daughter was a year and a half, Obviously, I was devastated, I was shocked, I just, it, my life didn't make sense. And I spent the next few years, you know, doing trial and error, thinking that rushing into another marriage would help me forget, which was the wrong approach. Obviously, none of the men were the right, were the right people. Mm -hmm. Until I now went to God and said, listen, do you even want me to be married again or not? After all, I actually have done it before, so I'm grateful. Actually, I'm a mother, so I'm grateful. And if you say, this is not for me, I'll be grateful. So I had to get to that point of total surrender. Mm -hmm. That whatever God's plan was going to be for me, I was going to be content with it. And mm -hmm. it took a while for me to get to that point. When I got to that point, and he then confirmed that, yes, he wanted me to be a wife. And he confirmed this through different people. I remember I was working with my career coach, well, she's more like a, a life coach. And, you know, it was as though God was using her to talk to me. She kept hammering on about this, you know, every successful woman must be successful in every part of their life. You can't run away from the relationship part. And I was like, I'm actually scared. I don't want to do it anymore. I, I, I'm she's like, no, 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 no. She wouldn't let it go. Mm -hmm. At the same time, my pastor was also on it. Mm -hmm. I was like, ah, okay. So I just kept praying and I said, okay, if... I'm meant to be married. Mm -hmm. I'm going to spend time doing research on what marriage is supposed to be about. And I'm going to the source. I spent six months listening to every sermon, following everybody on YouTube, listening to relationship podcasts, understanding the purpose of marriage, reading the Bible. What is this thing about? Because I don't like to do things I don't understand. When I felt that, okay, now I understand mm. it, a revelation just dropped in me that the reason why it hasn't worked with anybody else is because I have set you apart. Mm -hmm. I have set you apart. Set me apart for what? 
I'm like, I'm already following you, God. I've set you apart. Okay, then another one came. You will do my work with your husband. I still didn't. I still didn't get it. This is mm-hmm. like three years before I met Pastor Gabriel. Mm-hmm. I said, like, "Work, okay." Then one day I was sleeping, and I heard a man, a man's voice, call my name loud, and I jumped out of bed. Mm. And then the Bible verse came, Revelation three twenty. I was like, "Well, what does Revelation three twenty say?" And I went to see. Behold, I stand at the door knocking. And I said, like, but God, I'm already, I'm already following you. Why, why? I mean, I've already, already let you in. I didn't know that all of this was connected to what I am doing today. If mm. anybody told me that I would be a pastor's wife, me, my friends are here, they know me, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, you're laughing. Exactly. They know me well. This is not, this is not me. Mm-hmm. This was not in my plan. Yeah. Okay. But the, prophecy had, the prophecies had come. Mm-hmm. And even the messages had come to me. I didn't understand them until it unfolded and it happened. So what you said about marriage being about purpose, this marriage is bigger than the two of us together. It's mm-hmm. about the purpose that we are serving. Yes. And it is easier when you yield to what God has in store for you. Yes. So you need to go and do that research with God. You need to ask him. You need to be curious and intentional to know whether this is the path for you or not. Mm-hmm. Then... How do you date intentionally after heartbreak? Yes, I had the biggest heartbreak. My husband died. That's like the biggest heartbreak you can mm-hmm. ever experience. And I wouldn't wish it on anybody, particularly when you're in your 20s. Mm-hmm. However, you have to be open and determined to try again, which takes courage. And if you're doing it intentionally in God's purpose, you must do it in God's purpose all the way. What does that mean? That means no sex before mm-hmm. marriage. That means listening to God for direction on how much to give, yes. how much to hold back, listening to God when you ask him for the answer. And when he gives you the answer, you need to follow it because it yeah. may not be what you want to hear. You may like the guy and he may say, this is not him. Mm-hmm. But God, I really, really like him. That's not him. Mm-hmm. So it actually takes a lot of work on your part and you have to be ready to do the work. Mm-hmm. And the question is, are you ready to do the work, number one? And number two, are you ready to wait for the answer? If you are ready and you're also ready for the person, then yeah. success is guaranteed. Exactly. Michelle, anything to add? Um, just being clear. Thank you. If your identity is a wife, what is the purpose of a wife? What are the functions of a wife? I think a lot of people don't really know what the job description of a wife is. No. They just want to be one because you've been told that that's what you should be. So find that out because it might not be for you. No. You know. Um, would I like to be married? Sometimes I think so, sometimes I don't. Based on if I feel lazy that day. <laughs> because it's, it's work. Yeah. If you're going to do it right, you know. So, um, and, and blending your life with someone and letting, yeah. uh, you know, I always accidentally call mar- weddings funerals. Ooh. Because. That's harsh. Yeah. And I okay. call funerals weddings. Because it's the day that it's you, the die, day you to die to yourself. Yes, it is. You mm. know. Um, you now have to check in with someone. Mm-hmm. You now have to share space with someone. Mm-hmm. You now have to share resources with someone. You now have to acquiesce your dreams to be in alignment with their plan for you. I mean, that's a lot. And I think that you don't think about it because we've been pressured to get married. My life is so full that I know that God will have to create the space for that person. Definitely. I don't know where he would fit, honestly. <laughs> But well, I, mean, I, I know that when books. I'm called, it won't be about him just complimenting my life. I will have to compliment his life. Yeah. And it will have to blend together. How that will happen will be up to God. Seriously. It will mm. take a very, very special man. And I know that. Yeah. And I believe that God really wants you all to be in the lane of what he's called you to do so that that person knows what they're signing up for. Oh, yes. Because the most horrible thing is if you go to the store, you buy a box of Cheerios and you get home and find Frosted Flakes in it. Mm-hmm. Okay, now you can't take it back to the store because you opened it. That's covenant. <laughs> yeah, that's covenant. You see? So have your life in alignment with where God wants you to be so that everybody knows what they're getting. You know what you're getting. He knows what he's getting. You know, as far as being annoying, uh, if you're ordained to be, to be married, she said something very critical. Surrender. Surrender that dream. Give it to God. Mm. It shouldn't be a goal for you. No. It should be an inspiration. 
which means you meet someone, you say, wow, I'm a better person and I'm doing life better because of this person. This is who I want to spend my life with. Until then, why are we, why are we stressing? It's like being in a desert saying, oh, I'd love an ice cream cone. Do you see an ice cream shop? <laughs> You're just setting yourself up for frustration. Now, if the ice cream shop is there, you could go in and decide which flavor you want. Isn't that a better way to do it? Way better. So let us not set ourselves up for frustration when there's no option at hand. And don't think that it's the devil keeping something away from you. God is sovereign over the devil. Yes. Okay? And he has his own way of orchestrating your steps. The steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. You just stay in sync with God. And at the right time, you will happen on your field and Boaz will see you. Amen. Amen. There's a verse I really like uh, in Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, which talks about women should not put on men's clothing mm -hmm. and men should not put on women's clothing. Mm -hmm. I did not realize mm -hmm. until I got the revelation that it's about swapping of roles. Yes. It's not about clothes. It's not about clothes. Women should not play the roles of men and mm -hmm. men should not play the roles of women mm -hmm. because what ensues is frustration and all the things we spoke about. And there's a question here about, you know, um, how do you refuse to pay bills, etc., when your husband is not working, but you, are, but you are, and you earn more than enough to pay? Why and, is oh, your husband not working? Uh-huh. It becomes That's the, the question. first question. If he's incapacitated, like he's hurt himself, then okay, your partners, you help. If he's just sitting his bum down, expecting you to do it, that becomes a different issue. And mm -hmm. he needs to feel the burn, as they say at the workout place. Yes. You know, um, and, and unfortunately, in order for you to get the man that he's supposed to be, you'll have to suffer through that. Mm -hmm. But it will have to be on him because it says in the word that the woman is the glory of the man. What is the glory? The glory is the evidence of his presence and his power. God's so presence on. and power and a man's presence and power. So we are the evidence of a man's presence and, and power. power. Yeah. So that means that we reflect who he is. If he's not paying the bills, it needs to be reflected that he is worse than an infidel. The, <laughs> the Bible says that a man who does not take care of his family, God yes. considers him worse than an infidel. infidel. An infidel is an unbeliever. Which mm. means now he's not even under the umbrella of favor anymore. Mm. It says that men are supposed to treat women well or their prayers won't be answered. answered. So you see, even God considers you more precious than you consider yourself. Mm -hmm. Stop doing the man's job. You know, if he doesn't want to pay the bills, you eat. Let him find a way to eat. <laughs> he'll figure it out and he'll, and he'll rise to the occasion. I guess, Michelle, it's, it's, it's hard when you didn't start out that way. Yeah. So for people who are already married and this thing has crept in, they don't know how to reverse it. Mm -hmm. If you are starting out and I, I have all this information, I'll set the boundaries and we move on. Yeah. But if you're already married, you're like 10 years deep mm -hmm. and this behavior has been allowed to continue for five, six, seven years, mm -hmm. what do we do now? Conversation. Mm -hmm. A conversation has to be had. Men, for the most part, don't like going to counseling or whatever. Yeah. So let it start at home because now it's an offense, isn't it? Yeah. So we have to follow the protocol of offense. When someone has offended you, you go to them and you let them know why you're offended. If they don't listen to you, you bring a witness to mediate. Yeah. If, if he doesn't listen to the witness, then you go to an elder or counselor in church or a therapist or a counselor, whoever you can trust that's objective and qualified to mediate the situation. Now, when I say that, it's going to be very critical how you communicate. Mm. You cannot go and demand and accuse. The person will just defend themselves and not hear anything you say. So what you've got to do is locate what is going on with this person that has allowed them to settle into this place. Yeah. So that is where I would start the discussion. Why are you not motivated? Can you talk to me about how you're feeling? You know, draw him out. It says that the person with understanding draws out the deep things of the heart in Proverbs. So this is a conversation about, I'm your partner. Let's talk. What's happening here? 
because this is what I need from you. Mm -hmm. And it's not happening. And what it's doing is this, it's actually, you got to confess it because it's true. You've lost respect for him. Yep. And when you lose respect, you lose desire. Mm -hmm. So you've got to get back to, I want the man that I married, the one that gave me chill bumps. Mm. This is not working. How can I help you? Mm. What do we need to have happen here mm. in order to correct this situation? Because I'm losing desire and respect and I don't want to because I love you. So these are conversations that we have to have where you allow him to feel safe to voice what's going on with him. Maybe there's a fear, maybe there's an inadequacy. Can we pray together about this? Uh, what can I help you with? How can I partner with you to get you back on your feet? Because this isn't just about me, it's about our children, it's about our home, it's about you. Yeah. You know, this is your reputation. Now, if all of that fails, then you need to go to a family member or someone who's objective to step in to talk. So there is a process, but it can be fixed. Sometimes they think it's okay with you, yeah. and you need to know it's not. And I think, it, it, you know, they have to want it to be fixed. Yes. Because if only one person is trying to fix. Thank you. And the other person is not interested, it actually can't be fixed. Yes. Yes, but at least then we have to Then there's another decision to make. And that's another layer. Yeah. The last question before we continue. Somebody said, how do you... Okay, just a second. How can you be supportive of your husband while putting in these boundaries? So I think they're talking about ensuring the man does what he's supposed to mm -hmm. do and not doing it for him. Maybe before you come in, I mean, a man told me, a client of mine told me that men learn by being shown what to do, not being told. Yeah. So you have to show him. Mm -hmm. So if you want him to do certain things around the house, stop doing them. Yeah. Just leave it and let him do it. Yeah. And that's coming from a man, but maybe it would be good to hear what you have to say about that. Well, also, I mean, again, communication is critical. We, we as a society, we don't, don't communicate talk. well, no. We don't talk, we just get attitude. We're just angry black women. Silent, angry black women. The eyes talk. But that doesn't motivate a man. No. You have to find the places to praise him so that he lives for the next praise. Because that is where men reflect the heart of God. They look for worship. Um, Shanti Feldman, a friend of mine who wrote the book um, for women only, interviewed men, hundreds and hundreds of men, and asked them what makes them feel loved. And they all said respect, mm -hmm. honor makes them feel loved. Mm -hmm. So if you take away their respect and their honor and they don't feel loved, they're not motivated. So you have to find the things to praise, and then you have to, like she said, help them help you. Honey. I would really appreciate it if you would do this. I really need you to do this. See, and this is the way, if you do it like this, then it's good. Then, oh, okay, that's fixed. Sometimes they just want to know what to do. People would do better if they knew better. Yeah. Help them help you. Mm. Don't say, figure it out. You're on your own. You should know. Maybe they don't. And sometimes, let's put the answer in the question. Yeah. So, honey, wouldn't it be nice if we drove a black car? Mm -hmm. we bought, wouldn't it be nice if maybe we bought a new car and it was black? He yeah. Said, hmm. He'll come back and say, I've decided we should buy a black car. Yeah. <laughs> Put the Let answer in the question. Be their idea. <laughs> All right. So let's move on. And I want us to talk about something that I think is very, very prevalent amongst women, especially in our society. And this is about competition amongst mm -hmm. women, especially when it comes to men and sharing men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have this situation where you work in an office, on an environment, everything is going well, then suddenly a new girl comes and everything is upset. The guys obviously are friendly towards her. The women gather, stand, look at her, size her up and down, say look at her clothes, look at her hair, look at her this, and start being hostile towards her. And we see this behavior amongst women, not just in relation to romantic relationships with men, we see mothers competing with their daughters for mm -hmm. their husband's attention. We see sisters being nasty towards their brother's wives. Mm -hmm. It's competition. 
we see mothers horrible to their daughter-in-laws because of the attention they want from their sons because he used to listen to me. Mm -hmm. I was the most important woman in his life. And suddenly here you come yeah. and now I'm nobody. And it all comes back to competition amongst women. We do everything to have the heart of a man, mm -hmm. to be the most special person to him. This is why we enable, this is why we pay his fees. This is why we do all these yeah. things. We assist beyond, above and beyond because we want to be the special person. Yeah. And then we now hate and berate the other woman. Even when a man cheats, yeah. we blame the other woman. Yeah. What about the man? What and about his, his accountability, his responsibility? So we have it in for our sisters. Mm -hmm. And this is all coming from the garden, right? This yeah. is coming from, from Eve. Mm -hmm. And there are w many women in the Bible who did this. Mm -hmm. The one that shocked me was Miriam and Moses, Numbers mm -hmm. 12. Mm -hmm. Miriam was the one who put Moses in the basket, her, her brother. Mm -hmm. She took care of him. Then later on, when he was leading the people out of um, Egypt, she was with her brother Aaron and Moses. Everything was going well until Moses went to marry that black woman from Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And Miriam was like, ah, he's going to marry this dark-skinned woman. Mm -hmm. And because of her, he don't listen to me anymore. After all, God speaks to me as well, mm -hmm. and Aaron as well. And then God himself came down yes. and said, you dare to speak against my servant Moses? I don't even give him dreams. I speak to him face to face. Yeah. And because you discriminated against that woman because of her skin, I will give you leprosy. You'll be put out of the camp and you will know what it feels like to be discriminated against. Yeah. And why did Miriam do this? Because her brother was not listening to another woman mm -hmm. and not her. And that's brother and sister. Mm -hmm. Sarah and Hagar. Mm -hmm. Sarah actually gave her husband away. Yeah. She said, go sleep with my maid. Yeah. Not and then got upset about yeah. it. Because that's she the thing. Her. That's the thing, Michelle. I don't think we're not able to project or estimate our emotional responses to things. Mm -hmm. We're doing it with logic until it happens that we didn't know would feel this way. So when Sarah herself gave Abraham away, she now hated Hagar for sleeping with him. Mm -hmm. because, of because, of course, sex breeds certain emotional relationships and ties. And then she got pregnant. And then she got pregnant so that the man is bonded to her. And now Sarah is hating Hagar because Abraham, by all means, is giving her attention. Yes. I mean, you can't sleep with somebody living in the same house and you're not giving them attention. Right. So this thing about competition, where is it coming from and how can we stop it? Oh, there's one more. Oh, there's Let's one more. Let's talk about Rachel and Leah. And even there's you more. Know, Lot's daughters. Even, yes. Even worse. Yes. Rachel and Leah, yes. But Le Rachel and Leah, I, I think, strike me because we know that Jacob was in love with Rachel from the start. The father now gives Leah to Jacob. He then works another seven years so he can still have Rachel. And they get into this whole competition of birthing babies. Mm. Now, the Bible, God is very interesting when we start to compete with each other. Yeah. He said he closed Leah's womb. Rachel's Stop womb. rebuking the devil for your for your womb. God has the power to open and close, depending once again on his purpose. purpose. You don't have a baby just to have a baby. The baby is ordained for a purpose. purpose. Okay? So now, he closes Rachel's womb. He says, well, she's got love. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> She doesn't need children. Yeah, it says that he, God knew that, that Leah was in love, so he opened her womb. Okay? So she has a child, and she says, oh, perhaps my husband will love me now. She has five children, and every time she has a child, she says, oh, perhaps my husband will love me now. So even her motivation and agenda for having a child was wrong, although God allowed it because he had his own kingdom purpose for all these babies. Mm. Okay? Now, finally she gets to the place where she realizes that her producing children is not moving the heart of Jacob at all. So she says, this time, I'll just praise the Lord. <laughs> okay? Now, when she gets to that point, it's interesting she stopped having babies. Mm. And I think that there was a sense of fulfillment that she then had. Mm. And she began to rest in God's love. But then the competition heated up again. Yeah. Now Rachel has a baby. Then they start giving their maids to the husband. Poor Jacob must have been a very confused man. <laughs> oh, who am I sleeping with tonight? Okay, whatever, you know. I yeah. mean, he, he just was just, 
a man manipulated and pulled back and forth. I'm sure he wasn't that happy at the end of the day. Mm. It's interesting that though Rachel had the love of her man, she never invested herself in the love of God. Mm. And it killed her in the end. She stole her father's idols because she didn't have a relationship with God. With God. And that was the death of her. Now, why do I say all of that? Competition leads to death. It also confuses the men in our lives. They don't know how to treat us. Mm. And so they mistreat us. When there's a lack of understanding, you'll find a misuse, okay, of things. So we really set ourselves up. Imagine in this world, if every woman told a man who was already in a relationship or married, I will have nothing to do with you. I will not dishonor my sister that way. Mm. What would happen? There wouldn't be any adultery. Yeah. There wouldn't be any unfaithfulness. So guess who feeds that? We, we do. do. We do. We do. When a man comes to me, first thing I ask is, are you married? Okay, where's your wife? Because I won't be friends with you unless I'm friends with your wife. I won't dishonor her. What am I doing? I'm sowing seeds for my own relationship. Mm -hmm. God is going to honor the fact that I did that and keep my husband faithful to me. Yeah. So the seeds that you sow by compromising yourself and allowing, you know, flirtation even, I don't allow it because it opens the door for deception. So it's very, very important that we draw the lines of how men treat us and set it as a standard for how they treat all women. And when we decide to be true sisters to one another and hold one another up. Now, you know, it's very interesting that even though Leah was given to Jacob and she wasn't loved, she was the one who got him in the end anyway. Rachel was dead. Yeah, that's true. So the thing is, I think the principle there is that God will give you the love that you want and need in the right time and space if you allow him to orchestrate it. Fighting over men, competing for men, it's a no-win situation. Don't even stress yourself. As they say, you can't come and kill me. Old. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. So uh, once again, too, this goes to your value. I mean... If you have a sense of value, that is so beneath you. Really? Do I need to compete? I don't. I'm a prize. The right person will recognize. Yep. I don't have to convince anyone of my value. I walk in my value. It's evident. Mm. And those who know that they are not up to the task disqualify themselves, and I'm grateful for that. Yeah. That's one less person I have to say no to. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> You understand, yes. when you put it in the right perspective in your mind, it's never that you were rejected, you were protected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, God's protection is man's rejection. Exactly. That's, that's so important. But what about the competition between like mother, mother and mother-in-law and mother, and what, what, is, what is that one about? It's about the fact that their mates are not fulfilling them. Good. And so now the son is their surrogate husband. And we've seen a lot of these disgusting movies where the mother is sleeping with her son and mm. the wife finds out about it. I mean, I was shocked when I saw a movie like that. I was like, ah. But then it made sense to me. Because if a woman is not getting what she needs and wants from her husband, of course her son now becomes her surrogate husband. And that has to stop at it some level. It has to stop. And the poor guy is confused because his mother is his mother. Mm. So how is he going to say no to his mother? Mm. But mm. It, it, it just sets them up for, for robbing them of their true masculinity. And so mothers need to celebrate releasing their sons to be husbands. And now seeing and recognizing that they're gaining a daughter. A yeah. daughter that they should be speaking life into because the Bible says the older women yes, should be teaching the teach younger, younger women, women. Yeah. how to love their husbands. Mm. how to respect their husbands, how to honor their husbands. And so that is now, as a mother-in-law, your function. Again, when we don't know our roles, our functions, and our assignments, we do the wrong thing. Mm. So there's a concept that I heard recently that, that I was quite surprised at, and it was a man who said it. So I went to a woman's program, 
and there was a Lebanese man, mm -hmm. and he said, I want to just ask a question. He said, in my culture, Muslim, in my religion, we don't touch women. We don't, we don't just touch women. So, so I was, he said, I was in my office, the last office, and I saw two of my employees. And the guy just came and hugged the girl and put his whole body up against her. And I was quite alarmed. So when the guy left, I came to the girl and I said, like, are you okay with that? Is this sexual harassment? She's like, oh, that's my work husband. What's the, with the work husband? Because what's happening is that Women are competing in the office mm -hmm. for the attention of men in the office. They yes. have men at home, though. Mm -hmm. But they want to be the one who is favored, who is noticed, so there's a lot of flirtation, things that border on sexual harassment or, mm -hmm. you know, almost sexual relations at uh -huh. work. And what is this concept of work hazard? Because whether we call it a name or not, it's happening here in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it my own self, where people in the office discriminate or are nasty to other women because they feel like you're running up on my work husband. I eat lunch with him every day. Oh my God. I, he's the one that, you know, we talk all the time and suddenly you have come and you are the new slim one and you are the one and why are you taking away attention from me? That's my work husband. I'm well, serious. Why are we at work? Are we working? I mean, I just want us to address it because it's happening, you know. So why the Bible says, <laughs> the Bible says women submit yourselves to your own husband. husband. Your own. Your own. Not somebody <laughs> else's. Your own husband. Do you have a husband? Then you're not submitting yourself to any husband. Mm. If you have a husband, you're only submitting yourself to that one husband. Mm. This work husband thing. Why do we, and, and you know, it, the thing that shocks me, I think even in Ghanaian culture, I'm living, I've been living here for 10 years, and we are quick to say that we are a Christian society, mm -hmm. that we are majority Christian, 80-something mm -hmm. percent Christian. Mm -hmm. We don't act like it. No. We don't carry ourselves as, as men and women of God. We cannot compromise our standards and start acting like the world. We are there to set a standard. When you look at people like Daniel in, in uh, the book of Daniel, mm. here is a guy who worked in a heathen society. And yet the lines were clearly drawn as to who he was, who he served, and the compromises that he would not make. To the point where three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro, I mean Abednego, <laughs> <laughs> allowed themselves to be thrown in the fire. Before they would compromise, they would rather face death. They said, if God does not deliver us, <laughs> we still will not bow. Mm. Where is that conviction in our hearts as Christians? And this is why it horrifies Tega. I will confront you. I will ask you, do you know Jesus? <laughs> why are you acting like that? Why are you compromising in this area of your life? Why are you dressing like that? Why are you exposing yourself? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why? Because the kingdom depends on us representing it well. Mm. We have ambassadors in this country. I went to the home of one yesterday. I did not eat Ghanaian food. I ate his culture's food. Yeah. Because he wanted to introduce me to his culture. He wanted to recruit me to like his culture. That is what we are supposed to be doing. We are supposed to be showing the glory of what it looks like to belong to God so that other people want to. People are looking for truth. When they see us compromising in the workplace and doing these silly things, they go, what's the difference? Why should I difference? serve your God? By the time it was over, Daniel was so strong in his convictions that he faced a lion and the lion couldn't eat him. I love that story. Satan is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Yeah. He did not have the permission to devour Daniel. And the king couldn't even sleep that night worrying about Daniel, even though he had called for him to be yeah. thrown in the lion's den. And he came and said, was your God able to keep you? Daniel said, yes, sir. And he then stood up and decreed that all of Babylon should serve Daniel's God. Yeah. That is what happens when we represent in the workplace, on the corner, in the store, wherever you place yourself, someone should see the difference. Mm. Do not buy in, even when it comes to this word femininity. I go, uh, 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 no, feminism. Feminism, right? yes, okay. feminism. Why is a child of God even taking on that title? Did God name you feminism? 
So the world created this title, which started off with good intentions and got perverted. I'm not against what the agenda of equal pay and all of that is all about. I'm not up with man hating and burning your bras, no. Please put them on. <laughs> but why are we taking on titles and suggestions from the world if we have the mind of Christ? Scientifically, you operate at 85 to 90 percent subconscious and 10 to 15 percent conscious. If you've lost your mind now, the subconscious should all belong to Christ. We should have the mind of Christ, which means we only say what he says and do what he says, like what he likes, hate what he hates. Mm. We take on the persona of Christ. The word Christian is not about you going to church. The word Christian means you imitate Christ. They call them Christians because they said, oh, they remind us of Christ. Jesus. They're, they're the little Christ. Are you a miniature Christ? Mm. Do you look like Jesus? Or do you look like the world? Answer that question in your private time. Mm. So you don't have a work husband. <laughs> and you don't care who he's paying attention to because yes. he's not yours. Exactly. Don't claim people who are not yours. And carry yourself in a way that you are a living epistle, which means you're not so much saying what people shouldn't do. You're modeling it so that their heart is convicted in their own space. Amen. Thank you, Michelle. At this point, I want to ask if anybody has any questions they want to stand up and maybe mention. I'm seeing your questions here. If you want to also stand up and ask a question, we can bring the mic to you. Okay, so there are two hands up. Please take the mic. And I think that in the discussions, you mentioned about the Holy Spirit being a very good investigator. Yes. But how then do we then ask him to direct us? If you don't know him, how then do you get directions from him? So how do we practically get to develop a relationship with him so that he can get to direct us? So for me, when I made that decision that I want to get closer to God, I want to, you know, really walk in that knowledge and have that intimate relationship with him the first step was to read the word he's a living word this is how you get to know him so i had to spend a lot of time and i remember that i used to meet with my pastor every wednesday every wednesday for like two years and what would we do i would go we would pray a little bit and we would study the word and i was amazed at how my mind was transformed i began to see things it was like my eyes had been opened i began to see things very differently Mm -hmm. And I began to be very, very grateful for things. Like, mm -hmm. we had these three little dogs at home. I never used to pay them any mind. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, I was so grateful for my dogs, mm -hmm. grateful for my car, grateful for my hair. I'm like, oh, God, thank you for my hair. It's really mm -hmm. nice. Thank you. You know, like, it was just things were changing. Mm -hmm. And that is when I began to experience a lot of empathy and compassion for men. Mm -hmm. Instead of seeing them as people who were just treating me badly and, you know, I was like, actually, they're also going through stuff themselves. They actually are trying to figure it out. It takes them a while to know whether you are the one. Because when they do commit to you, there's responsibility. He has to take care of you. He has to go and see your parents and go through that whole rigmarole that we mm -hmm. do when we get married. He has to stand, stand up as a man and take all this responsibility. So it's a process. So I found that the more time that I spent in the word of God and then praying, but it wasn't the word of God. It was going through the studying process. And it was like my eyes were being opened to things like, I have never seen this before. Yeah. I have read this before, but I never got this understanding. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, and I would listen to a lot of sermons. I used to follow this, what's his name? Pastor Mike Todd of Transformation Church. Yes. Pastor Stephen Fertig of, of mm -hmm. Elevation Church. Sarah Jakes Coleman mm -hmm. of One LA. I found this fantastic Bible teacher called Kim Cash Tate, mm -hmm. who teaches the Bible the way I like to study the Bible, mm -hmm. with structure, mm -hmm. a lot of structure, five reasons why you need grace, three reasons why you should do this. This is how I like to learn. And I was just like, wow. And there was one message, one teaching she did, which was just 10 minutes. And it was called, is God starving your appetite? Mm. And it was about making things idols in your life. Mm -hmm. And when, she's, when I watched that video, I was like, oh my God, she's talking to me. I have made marriage an idol in my life. It is here. And I'm looking at it. I want it. When? I want it. When? God, when you give it to me? Mm -hmm. When you give it to me? And she was like, remember the Israelites when they left Egypt? After a while, they were complaining that, oh, we want to go back to slavery mm -hmm. when we're eating cucumbers and onions. And I was like, wow, 
when I was actually married the first time, there were issues. Let me not pretend that because the guy died, <laughs> it was perfect. And, I, and what, I want to just go back to that because I want to just be married. Mm -hmm. Remember and that, it's familiar. Re yeah, and it's familiar. You know, that day, I just sat down like this. She was talking to me. I wrote like three or four pages of notes. I need to let this thing go. So you have to start that way and it builds up. Then you, you, you develop that intimacy with God where you can just talk to him. Mm -hmm. And I found that when I built that relationship, when I needed the Holy Spirit to teach me things, when I said, show me who my husband-to-be is, mm -hmm. I would lie in bed and say, hmm, God, you need to tell this guy that he needs to be on time. Because he, sometimes he's late. And I can't, do, I can't deal with it because I'm a very, my friends would tell you, like, it has to be this way. It has to be this way. And I've also changed it, but I've become mm -hmm. a lot more flexible. You need to tell him he needs to be on time. And you know, as if by magic, the following day he will say, I'm really trying to be on time for you. I'm, really, I'm like, wow. So <laughs> instead of me just talking at mm -hmm. him, if I just, you know, this is why you must accept the people that you love mm -hmm. with all their flaws. Because you have your flaws as well. Mm -hmm. When I was asking God that, can you tell him to be on time? He was probably saying, God, can you make this girl a bit flexible? <laughs> oh, God. Like if you are just two minutes late, she'll be like, ah. mm -hmm. you can see in her posture. So I think that when you build that relationship, and you are building it because you want a relationship with God, not because you want him to give you things or give you a man or give you money. You are building it because that is the most important relationship you must have. Mm -hmm. And I feel that as women, sometimes we put our men on pedestals and make them idols in our lives. Mm -hmm. We make them idols. Mm -hmm. When you take the time to make God number one in your life, mm -hmm. what he does, I will liken it to two of us sitting here together. Mm -hmm. And that's how I liken my marriage. Yeah. We're sitting together, but there's somebody between us. Mm -hmm. So we cannot get lost in each other. Yeah. I cannot put him higher than God because God is blocking the way. He's mm -hmm. like, to get to him, you have to pass through me. Mm -hmm. To get here, you have to pass through him. So we are here loving each other, holding hands, but God is in the middle. So I don't have to calculate, like, am I giving him too much of myself? I, it's impossible because yeah. I'm giving myself to God. Mm -hmm. So God will regulate the temperature. Mm -hmm. He'll regulate the relationship. So what you must do is build the relationship with God first. Yes. For no other reason, just that you want that relationship with God to be whole. Mm -hmm. Everything else will be added unto you. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's and right. And everything else will be added unto you, including the marriage you want, if that is your portion. Mm -hmm. The children you want, if that is your portion. The car, whatever it is you want. But desire the relationship with God because of it, not yes. because of anything else. Yes. So those are my practical steps. Michelle, mm -hmm. over to you. Yes. <clears throat> Knowing the word is critical so that when you hear voices, you know who's talking. Yeah. Um, you know... God told me to kill somebody. No, you should know that that's not God because that goes against his word. So when it says we have the mind of Christ, is we have a knowledge of his will, his purpose, his plan, his personality, his character, how he thinks, how he moves, what motivates him, what he likes and what he doesn't like. And all of that information is found in this great big people magazine called the Bible. Mm. So just like you read gossip for the gist, you need to read that Bible to know who you are dealing with, mm. how he thinks, how he moves, what makes him angry, what makes him sad, what's his favorite food. I say it's barbecue because he likes burnt offerings. You know? <laughs> <laughs> huh? So, you know, I mean, really look for him. Look for his personality. Mm. You know, the stories in the Bible are in two categories, descriptive and prescriptive. Mm. You've got to be able to recognize the difference. The descriptive ones is, here's what happened. Learn the principle from the story. I'm not saying you try this exactly at home. No, do not go running off marrying a prostitute. That was a story that I gave to illustrate and describe my, my love for a wayward people. Mm. Then there's the prescriptive, which is God's direct dis it, um, instructions and directions for things that you should and should not do, okay? So you need to know the difference between those two things. Now, the word says, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, to go. walk ye in it. Now, when you know, and you've been practicing the presence of God, and you've been spending time with God, and you know what his voice sounds like, okay, it's like, if Aisha calls me, um, I, I meet Aisha, I give Aisha my number, 
she calls me. She has to tell me who she is. I'm not that familiar with her voice yet, mm. right? Yeah. But if I keep talking with her on a regular basis, there comes a time when she calls me and I go, hey, Aisha, I know before she announces. It's not because of caller ID on my phone. I know her voice. Mm. My sheep know my voice and another they will not follow. Mm. That comes from interaction mm. with God. That comes from consistent fellowship with him. Prayer is not a duty. It's an opportunity to get to know God better. Yeah. Prayer is not about you telling him what to do. Prayer is about you finding out the mind of God. Okay? So when that happens, when you get in a situation, you're now in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You're sensitive to his voice. You get that check in your spirit. You go, something told me not to. Someone mm. told you not to do that. The Holy Spirit is not a something. It's a real person that's been deposited into your spirit to counsel you daily. And if you're practicing, I just did this um, message called Abiding in God. And okay. it, just, it just excited me because I believe there's a place you can get to where you're so in sync with God's mind that you just literally land where you're supposed to land without yeah. consciously thinking, without having to ask the way every five minutes. I mean, I went on a trip, uh, I went to the States recently a friend of mine's mother had passed, and I was disappointed I wasn't going to be able to be at the funeral. And before I left, I just felt like I should visit a friend before I went to my sister's house in the city. So I called my friend, and I said, I'm going to come spend a couple days with you before I go to the suburbs. They said, okay. So I got there, and when I landed and got to the house, I got an announcement that my friend's mother's funeral was the next morning, 10 minutes from where I was staying. Wow. I was like, wow. So the next morning, we called Uber. The Uber went to the wrong address because I had planned this out, you know, that I would get there a half hour early so I could see the family, let them know I was there and surprise them, blah, blah, blah. I had my whole little agenda. And um, the Uber got lost. By the time I got there, it was over the half hour where I had wanted to be, and I was so annoyed. But then something said, calm down, I got this. Or oh, someone. When, yes, <laughs> when I got to the church, who was there at the door but the family being lined up to go in. They marched me in with the family. They were all like, oh, you're here. Yeah. So it worked out better than I could even have planned it. Mm. When I went in, I went to sit someplace, and they said, oh, you can't sit here. Mm. Can we move you back a row? When I got there, there was uh, the wife of Charles Jenkins. You know, our God is awesome, that guy. Yeah, yeah. And I, it had been in my mind that I needed to contact him. There was his wife sitting next to me. I couldn't have planned it better. Yeah. I ended up being able to organize my meeting with him. And on and on, the entire trip was like that. And the light came on. This is what our life is supposed to be like as believers. Mm. No accidents. Our steps ordered by God. Mm. Literally landing where we're supposed, supposed to, to land. Have the interactions we're supposed to have. Meet the people we're supposed to meet. Uh, transact uh, and, and here was the thing I went to uh, renew my driver's license that's usually several right hours mm. several hours so I had just adjusted my off. mindset yeah. for it I got there I didn't see anyone I went up and they said do you have an appointment I said I didn't know I was supposed to have an appointment all of a sudden out of nowhere here comes the supervisor it's okay you can go in and tell them I sent you mm. I went in, they took my picture, processed the whole thing. I was done in 10 minutes. I was in a state of awe. Oh, what? But as I stood at the counter and the woman said, here you go. And I said, that's it? The Lord spoke to me and said, just as this process has been accelerated, I am accelerating your harvest. Amen. This is a word for the body of Christ. Yes. That he is accelerating our harvest as we align ourselves in sync with purpose. him, abiding in him. He says that he is the vine, we are and the, the branches. branches. Apart from him, we can do nothing. 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 So why are we keep trying to produce stuff on our own? It is not possible. We need the juice from the branch emanating mm. through our system to create what he's creating, not mm. what we want to create. There's a mm. difference. Mm. So abiding in him. Getting to know that voice, knowing what his word says for yourself. Do not just go to church and sit and be spoon-fed by your pastor. Mm. 
Now, there are great pastors, and I, I, I like the list that you gave. I'll add Stephen Chandler, and there's a um, teacher called David Pawson. In fact, I'm going to add Darius Daniels. Oh, Darius, well. yes. I'm doing everything. I'm doing all his programs. <laughs> I'm in his den. I'm taking his everyday seminary. Yeah. I've just OD'd on Darius Daniels mm -hmm. because he is excellent. And, um, 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 but David Pawson, mm -hmm. he has a big, giant book in uh, uh, Amazon called... Uh, the Bible revealed, or some I forgot okay. the name. Unlocking the Bible. Okay. And literally, you can go to YouTube, David Pawson, P A W S O N. Mm -hmm. He literally will take you through the entire Bible, give you the background of things. I mean, awesome. Will just blow your mind. It's a Bible you haven't read yet. Mm. And Amazing. And when you know the mind of God, you recognize His voice and you walk in accordance with his plan and your way your lines fall in pleasant places yes. the crooked places become smooth the high places become low the rough places become smooth that's not to say you won't have difficulties because he uses difficulties as process to groom us and grow us and develop character and integrity and all of that but you will have peace no matter what is happening because you'll be in sync with god amen thank you there was another question, but I just want us to start this topic, okay. and then we'll go back. And this is an exciting one. Oh. Yes, this is about sex. Yay! <laughs> so the first time I heard this statement, I was actually blown up, because I'd never heard it before, mm -hmm. that sex is worship. Mm-hmm. I'd never heard this before. You never heard that before? No, it's my husband who said it, and he said it in passing, like how men do, like, oh yeah, yeah. you know, sex is worship. Mm -hmm. And I was like... Sex is worship. It is. I quickly went to do research. Sex, and I saw your book, Sex as Worship. So I didn't actually know mm -hmm. that basically when we are in a covenant, which is marriage, and we have sex with each other, that is the only time that God allows us to worship somebody else. Mm -hmm. God wants us to worship him and him only. Yes. But under covenant, he allows us to worship each other. Mm -hmm. That's the only time we are allowed to worship anybody else. Yeah. And basically the act of making love, having sex is worship. Yes. And I realized that you likened it to entering the Holy of Holies. Yes. The woman is the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. When there's offense, you cannot enter. Yes. And that is why Jesus came to die because there was offense between us and God. Yes. And you said that there are many parallels between the spiritual and the physical. Mm -hmm. And so the spiritual act of worship where we praise God and we surrender mm -hmm. and we empty ourselves is the same as the physical act of sex. Yes. Take it away, Michelle. <laughs> we all need to learn. I'm still, like, I'm still learning. You know, we all need to learn. So break it down for yes, us. Yes, that man is the high priest. The woman's body is the Holy of Holies. And you know that everybody could not enter the Holy of Holies, right? Only the designated high priest. So... And when he entered with no offense, then the glory of God came down and visited. And the people said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Say, Amen. Amen. Let's have church <laughs> if you marry. Now, it says, <laughs> Adam knew Eve and she conceived. The same word knowing there is used for kissing forward, kissing God. Knowing the intimacy of it is an act of worship. This is why Paul then comes in Romans and says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable act of what? Worship. Why did he say that? Because back in the day in Rome, they had altars erected to very various gods. And part of their worship was literally orgies on the altars in these temples. Mm. And so God, Paul now comes in and says, stop that. That is not how this is supposed to go. Now you walk in an honorable fashion, presenting your body, your surrender as a living sacrifice to God. You're not having sex on the altars. You're not bearing yourself that way. It is an act of worship. Adam knew Eve and she, con she conceived. When we know Christ, we conceive of the fruit of the spirit and we bear the attributes of Christ to the world. And so this is the, the, the parallel between the, the physical act of sex and the spiritual act of worship, that we enter in pure of offense, clean of offense, sanctified, set apart for this thing. 
You know, this is why the world perverts sex so much and ever has everyone insisting on their own way. Mm. It's your personal life. Why do I need to know? Your personal life is something you keep to yourself. It is sacred. Mm. It should be kept undercover. I should not have to acknowledge, accept, celebrate, tolerate anything that you're doing personally because mm. it's not my business. Do you understand? Yes. So now, when we take this as a sacred thing, uh, Solomon said, my bride is a garden enclosed and locked that no one else can enter. He took pride in being able to say that. The brothers of the Shulamite woman said, are you a wall or are you a door? Hey, are you a wall or are you a door? If you are a wall, we will honor you. We will, we will um, crown you in gold and silver. If you are a door, allowing others to enter where they shouldn't, it will be death to you. So you see, this thing is very serious. We talk about soul ties and all of that. You know, the, it, it, God created sex as a glue. Mm -hmm. He created it so that when you enter into covenant with your husband and your husband makes you upset, you don't want to leave because you're addicted to his love. The Bible literally says that the man is to be intoxicated with the breast of his, of the, of his wife. That he should be intoxicated always and love her as a lover who loves still. That's what Proverbs says. So now, God has given it to us for pleasure, but also to bond us together. So now when you go and sleep with someone who says, oh baby, I, I, I like your shake. <laughs> and then he drinks the shake and he's gone. And you're wounded. I think that you're grieving not his departure as much as you're grieving the parts of yourself you can't get back. Mm. Because if you, if, if you put two pieces of paper, let's take two pieces of paper, put glue on them, and put them together and let the glue dry. What happens when you pull the paper apart? They tear. It tears. It does not separate well. That's your spirit. And how many times will you do that? What's left? Now the person who's worthy of you shows up. There's nothing left. The excitement for sex is gone. The excitement for intimacy is gone. You're worn out. You're over it. Because all those disappointments carried off pieces of you that you can't get back. So now you have to rebuild. You have so to now you have to rebuild time. and be restored. And, and why? It's unnecessary. If you just kept yourself. God doesn't tell you not to sleep around because he doesn't want you to have a good time. He tells you not to sleep around because he wants you to have a good time. He says, enjoy your marriage bed. It is blessed. Just don't do something in it that will hurt you or kill you. But other than that, it's free game. If you're both mutually consenting to, to things that are healthy, there's some things that are not healthy. <laughs> Hello. So all of that to say that once again, God always sets everything in motion that points back to himself, points back to his glory, is another parallel of what's going on in the spirit realm. So sex is worship. It is a foretaste of the glory we will experience, the pleasure we will experience when we become one with God. And that orgasm is a foretaste of the immense pleasure that will be sustained throughout eternity. Glory to God when you, <laughs> when you finally get there. So if you keep that in mind and know that sex is a sacred place, that your body is considered sacred, so sacred that in the Old Testament, if a maiden tried to break up a fight and accidentally touched a man's genitals, her hand was to be cut off. How sacred? Did God consider the body? Mm. If accidentally your hand <laughs> should be removed, what happens when it's there on purpose? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Hi. So we go, oh, this is hard. This is a discipline that's hard. Isn't it harder when your heart is broken? Mm. After you've given yourself and the person's walked off and now you feel like nothing? I gave myself and I've been rejected, which means I'm not valued, because then you end up saying, what's wrong with me? Yeah. You see how the enemy uses that? What he wants you to do is to protect your heart, protect your spirit, protect your body. See it as the valuable thing that it is. 
in uh, America, they have a company called Tiffany's. Mm -hmm. Tiffany's a very, very expensive high-end jewelry, jewelry shop. You never see a lot of people in Tiffany's because people know they can't afford Tiffany's. They, don't, they know don't even go in there if you're not serious because when you get to the door, they're going to say, may I help you? Yeah. Now, what are you looking for? Some men are just sniffing. You need to ask them, what are you looking for? What are your intentions? The minute they try to put their hand on you, you get to ask, what are your intentions? And if it's not covenant, then that hand should not be there. It shouldn't be there even if it is covenant because you need to honor me as your wife before I'm really your wife. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Round of applause. So essentially what it means is that when we have, when we have sex out of covenant, mm -hmm. we're actually cheating on God. Yes. Because we are worshiping exactly. other people we shouldn't be worshiping. We shouldn't be worshiping the people that we are in covenant with. That's our right. Because he says, husbands. I am your husband. He mm. says, I call you beloved. I call you Hepzibah. Okay? So if you already have a husband, what are you doing? He has not handed you over to the physical manifestation of himself yet. Mm. But you're already married. He says, your land shall be called married. So you're actually cheating. Mm. That's deep. I think we need to take that in. Mm -hmm. But then that leads us to the next topic, which actually I've seen some questions on already. And this is about infidelity. Mm -hmm. So what do we do when there's infidelity? For the most part, and I know it happens both ways, but for the most part, the men do step outside of the marriages, the relationships quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And how, I mean, how can you heal from that? Especially mm -hmm. if the man was the right person, you did it the right way, mm -hmm. he is the one who's supposed to be your husband, you are married to the right man. Mm -hmm. What happens when cheating happens? Because it can happen, we're all human beings. Happen. How do we come back from that? It happen. Um, you know, I wanna say something and back up a minute there. I don't think that our mindset should be to expect infidelity. And I think that that's a very common train of thought here. You know, well men cheat. They don't all cheat. They really don't. There are two types of men. There is one who has a faithful spirit and there's one that has an unfaithful spirit. You should be able to recognize the unfaithful spirit before you go into covenant with that person and know what's mm -hmm. gonna happen and not enter, okay? Then there's a man who has a faithful spirit. We see in the Bible, there were times when wives gave their husbands away. Yeah. So a full examination has to take place of why it happened. And that is not a situation where you make that man defensive. You need to ask, what, what went wrong between us? What was I not fulfilling? He might say, it wasn't you, it was me. He might have feelings of inadequacy based on his own fears and, and things that are going on with him that lead him outside. Or there might be a frustration of something you're not doing. So you need to find out if you were doing your job or not. And if it's not about you and it's about him, how can I help you if he wants to be helped? Maybe he doesn't, depending on if he's got an unfaithful spirit. Mm. If it's an unfaithful spirit, he might want you to just accept it and say, oh, it doesn't mean anything. You know, I love you. I'm here with you, aren't I? I haven't left. Well, you need to leave because yeah. you're bringing germs home. <laughs> Hello. Hi. I mean, there's a reality that he's now endangering you if he's, if he's yeah. a, a, you know, a, a serial infidelity person, yes. you know? Um, so if he's a serial cheater, He's putting your body at risk, mm. especially now, not, not just venereal diseases. Now we got COVID to deal with too. You don't Can know you who's, imagine? you know, there's so many things. And the record that it's also setting in front of your children because your children know, mm. the neighbors know, people know. So it's not a healthy situation. Now the other one who is broken uh, and confesses that it's a mistake is repentant then you have to rebuild trust. Mm. And he's got to understand that that's a process for you. So now he's got to be accountable and you need to seek counseling together and rebuild trust. It can be rebuilt. It can make your marriage stronger than it was before. So the possibilities for rebuilding are there, but the work must, must be, be done. done. Yeah, and it's not just a one-sided thing. Right. Both people. So, I mean, this is a difference between weakness and wickedness, yes. right? 
anybody can make a mistake yes. because we're all human beings. Yes. And if it's a mistake and I see it as a mistake, I'll be really scared about what my wife, how my, my wife would react. Right. I'll be remorseful. But wickedness is where I go and have a whole family mm -hmm. over there yeah. and children and other things. And I keep having And I'm running with friends that think it's all yes, right. You exactly. know, the peer group also affects that exactly. and validates that type of behavior. Exactly. And, and, and that person needs to experience loss. I'm just going to tell you that <laughs> sometimes uh, people don't appreciate what they have until they've lost it. Mm. Now, that can be set up as a separation. I am not an advocate of divorce as a first option. But the Bible does give you a clause and as an out if this person is unfaithful. God does not accept unfaithfulness. He divorced Israel because of it. He mm. will not hold a human being to a higher standard than himself. Mm. But it should not be the first option. If that person is willing to work to rebuild a relationship, you do not have the excuse of leaving. But if he just wants to justify his behavior and be unapologetic, you have another issue and a decision to make because that is not covenant. That person has broken covenant. Exactly. Thank you, Michelle. A very hot topic for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, we can take a question from the crowd before we continue. Is there any question anybody wants to? Okay, there's a question at the front. My name is Vida. And I'd like to ask, you know, throughout the conversation, one word has run through, which is purpose. Most of us, uh, going through so much in life because we have not yet found our purpose in life. Now, how do you find or identify your purpose so that every part of your life would sink in for you to feel very complete? I think that the pe reason people think they don't know their purpose is because they think their purpose is some huge, you know, thing. Like, I'm, I'm going to be on a stage speaking or I'm going to you know, be, uh, whatever that is. But purpose actually occurs every single day of your life. Today your purpose is to be here, gathering information that you're gonna use. Purpose tomorrow might be you're at church and you're serving and that thing wouldn't happen if you weren't there to do what you gotta do. Purpose is walking out every day according to God's will. plan yeah. and will. And that means touching who you touch, encouraging who you encourage, being there for who you're there for. The thing is, most of us will never do anything grand the way we think we should. Mm. But the accumulation of what we do will one day give you that aha moment of this is why I was here all mm. along. Mm. When I went to this woman's funeral, in Chicago. I have to tell you, it was the most fabulous funeral I have ever attended. And now it's weird to call a funeral fabulous, isn't it? But it was fabulous. It was such a celebration of her life. There were five people who spoke rather eloquently on the impact that she had had in their lives. And you know, she was a ballerina and she was all about posture and she would walk up to people in the grocery store and say, stand up straight. You know? <laughs> and by the time they were finished telling the stories about her, I found myself sitting up a little straighter. She was gone, but her impact was still felt. There were moments I laughed and I cried and I had dated her son. So I told him afterwards, I said, now everything about our relationship makes sense. Yeah. We're still friends, you know, but it, it, everything made sense. And it settled some things that I didn't even realize were not settled, mm. you know. So the thing is, we find ourselves like Rosa Parks. I'll go back to Rosa Parks. Yeah. You know, she just one doing action. her thing. And one day she was tired and it set off a whole flame. That was the aha moment. That was the defining moment. So most of us live moment by moment by moment. But then there's one grand defining moment. And when we get there, we know what that moment is. And everything that you did up to that point made you the person you are to have the defining moment. Mm. Does that make sense? For me as a child, I was born in London. My mother sent me to Barbados to live with my aunts, and then they moved to America, so I stayed with my grandparents. Then she married an American, and we moved to Michigan, and it was a very mundane existence, or so it seemed, but it gave me the foundation of, of who I am as a person. I was bullied a lot as a child. Now what that did was, as I got older, I became a champion for the underdog. Mm. Don't like to see anyone hurt 
or displaced because I know that feeling. Yeah. So it became a part of my character and who I am and why I speak up and why I do what I do. I was in purpose. The good, the bad, and the ugly is purpose because it forms you. It forms who you are. It informs your choices and creates the person that you are for other people and who you are for God. So I've become very self-aware about what's going on in my life today. Why is it happening? Mm -hmm. Why are we having this conversation? How can I make this a positive? Yeah. And based on me deciding to be more purposeful about where I am and with who I'm with each day, I now see purpose unfolding in a different way. Mm -hmm. It's much more conscious as opposed to unconscious. Because whether you know it or not, you're in purpose. That's the bottom line. You are where you are right now for a purpose. You are here absorbing information for a purpose that will later be revealed. You'll be having these conversations Patience. with other people. Mm. So now you're spreading. It's kingdom business. It's spreading knowledge to other people. You're here absorbing, but you're also going to regurgitate yeah. to specific yeah. people. Because in the days to come, these conversations are going to come up again where you are. You're going to say, ah, we were just talking about that at the so-and-so. Exactly. And this is what they said. And the person's going to say, oh, and guess what? Then that person's going to take the conversation and take it to someone else. And that is how God's kingdom is built and his word is spread. Mm. So you're always in purpose is, is really what I'm saying. There are just defining moments and aha moments along the way that become markers. Have you ever been someplace and you say, ah, I saw this before. Yeah. Have you had that happen? Yes. It's a marker in the spirit that you're exactly where you're supposed to be. It already occurred in the mind of God before you were created. Mm -hmm. And now he's letting you know, yep, you're right on course. This is exactly what's supposed to be happening in this moment. You're right on track. That gives you something to rejoice about. It is. Wow. It is. It is. I'm in sync with God. How exciting is that? Ooh, I didn't know we had it like that, God. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that is what fills you with a sense of purpose. Mm. I am... Like uh, Dr. Sue said, I am who I am. I'm Sam, I am. Mm -hmm. I don't like green eggs and ham. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and I think also maybe as women as well, we shouldn't crowd our lives with things just because we're trying to discover what our purpose right. is. Do things that you actually have time to do that will not make you collapse with exhaustion just because you want to do so many things and you want to be important or you want to be like you're in purpose. Like Michelle said, your purpose may be to raise your children and raise them well, mm -hmm. to be good human beings, to be, to be people who have a relationship with God, people who can impact society positively, you know. So that could be your purpose. So don't diminish what you are doing. What you are doing is important. Mm -hmm. You don't have to collect other things to add to it. Mm -hmm. Let's take Leticia's question, then we'll, we'll come back. And let me just add one last thing. Mm -hmm. Your purpose is the effective use of your giftings. What are your giftings? The things that come naturally to you, that feed you, that give you life, that give you joy, that bless others and prosper you. That's it. Yeah. Leticia. But just to refer back to what somebody asked earlier, when they asked how you kind of get over heartbreak, right? How mm. do you date after heartbreak? Yeah. And you gave your example, Aisha, but I think that, I mean, I'm not trying to just diminish your experience, mm -hmm. but there's a very different type of heartbreak when somebody has intentionally hurt you yes. or deceived you mm. or lied to you, right? And I kind of get, I just got the sense that that's what the person was mm. experiencing. Mm. You know, one of the reasons why I wanted to support this program, because I think, feel like a lot of women are going through yes. this heartbreak and they're broken and they're going into relationships still feeling very broken. Mm. So I was hoping that you would be able to build upon what Michelle started talking about when you have to rebuild yes. after you've been in the wrong type of relationship mm. and you come out of it feeling shattered and you're now trying to move on, but you're still broken, right? Mm. So maybe thinking about it in those practical steps. Yeah. What are the necessary maybe three or five steps that somebody has to take in order to be able to start rebuilding themselves in order to be healthy enough to go to go on and to try and look for love again? Love again. Yeah. Okay. So maybe mm -hmm. I'll share then you can continue. Okay. So yes, I did have a heartbreak like that, one of the wrong choices I made. <laughs> and I overinvested. That's the truth. I did too much for this individual and he took it. 
and he was sucking the life out of me. And when I realized it, and I walked away, you know, I, one of the statements I made was that I will cry my cry in private, but I will walk away from this relationship, which I did. Now, it was difficult, and the healing process was tough. I mean, people close to me could tell because I was losing weight, because I was thinking so much, and I was trying to make sense of it all. So the first step is to give yourself time to heal, or maybe the first step is to cut off from that person. Delete the number, block it. Do not engage in any conversations, explanations, because there's a mm. reason why you left. It was toxic. Mm -hmm. And that person is going to try and come back because it was good for him. Yeah. He was benefiting from me because I was giving. So you need to cut it off and don't go back. Secondly, you need to give yourself time to heal. And you need to engage yourself in other activities. So there is the serving. There is the supporting other people. There is doing community projects. There is also, if you have a good career, invest in it. But also give of yourself in a positive way, because that's part of the healing process. Those are my three steps. Mm -hmm. Cut the person off, give yourself some time, and then serve. And also build a relationship with God, maybe step four. Michelle, maybe I'll give it back to you. Yeah, one of the books I have, the book table actually is about this, um, The Real Deal on Overcoming Heartache. But I will also say that um, be honest about how you feel, first of all, because a lot of times pride sets in and we want to say it's not that deep or we try to convince ourselves it's not that deep. And that's quicksand. You'll keep flailing and fighting and going deeper into it because you haven't initially acknowledged how you really feel. Mm. You need to be able to sit down and, and pick apart what went wrong here and what do I need to learn from this because I'm going to come out of this better. So there's a determination that I'm going to come out of this better even though in spite of the mistakes I made here, let me see what those mistakes are. In this instance, pain becomes your friend because pain points to what's wrong. It, it points to the unsurrendered areas in your life that you need to fix because in, I'm, in the middle of a heartbreak, it's not just one person's fault. It's both people. Mm -hmm. there, it's what you said, what you didn't say, what you allowed, what you didn't allow. So you have to really take a realistic look at what exactly happened here. Journal, write it out, mm -hmm. look at it. What should I not allow to have happen again? What did I, what were the, and you know, there were red flags. Yep. There were things that, that, you're, that pricked your spirit, but you pressed past them hoping for something better. So one of the lessons we're gonna learn is to listen to that. Listen to the Holy Spirit when they say, check that out. Mm, that's not quite right. Mm, that shouldn't happen. So we're learning in the process of our pain. Then have a support system, but don't allow them to massage with you because we like to nurse and rehearse. And have you ever noticed the more you talk about something, the more upset you get? <laughs> yes. So it's okay to get it all out. Have that initial venting session. Blah, have diarrhea. Blah, get it all out. But after that, make a date for silence. I'm not talking about this anymore. No one's gonna come and tell me, I saw him over there with so-and-so, ooh, another knife in the heart. Let your friends know we will not be entertaining conversations about this person anymore. You're gonna block that person off of your phone because like she said, there's a reason it's over. Cut it off. Okay, um, after that, know that it's a process of time. You're gonna have a good day. And a bad You're gonna day. have a bad day. You're gonna have two good days, you're going to have another bad day. Time is going to heal a part of, 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 the, um, of what's going on with you. Michelle, just to interject, it's almost, it's kind of like you are mourning. It's, yeah. it's, you are grieving. It's a death. It's a death of the relationship and the parts of yourself you left with him. Yeah. So you have to go through the grieving process. Yes. So you will have good days and you will have bad days. You have crying days exactly. and then you will have the days where you feel strong. Mm -hmm. But you need to go through the process and that is why he must not be anywhere near you. Mm -hmm. Because you have to restart it all over again the yeah. moment you sleep with him again. Yeah. Or the moment he says, but what we had was so good. Yes. It was good for it's, me. It's like, oh, he kissed so good, but he beat your brains out. Do you yeah. remember that yes. part? Yeah. We tend to romanticize the good parts and, and, and cancel out the negatives. And we have to take realistic stock of the relationship. What really happened there? You know, and don't exactly. go jump into another relationship like a Band-Aid. You're slapping a Band-Aid over the wound. Allow the wound to heal so that you don't carry the garbage from this past relationship into the other one and superimpose it over this new innocent person that has no idea what happened, why it happened. And actually, you shouldn't even be having a conversation with him about that. 
because, you know, that might give him ideas. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's some things that you heal and you move on from. If mm -hmm. it's not something that affects the relationship you're in, it shouldn't be discussed with that person. Yeah. They, they don't need to know all of that, you know. Uh, present yourself as a whole person ready to have a whole relationship. Mm. But forgiveness is huge. Mm. Whether they did it on purpose or not, you must forgive. Yeah. Because now you're messing with your own capacity to be forgiven. And it also places you in bondage to that person. And they don't deserve to have that much power over your life moving forward. Mm. So forgive them. What forgiveness is, is actually release. It doesn't yeah. mean forgetting what they did. It's just saying, you know what? That was all they could give. That was their capacity. They did not have the capacity for integrity in our relationship. And I'm going to have to adjust my expectations. Because sometimes we want a gallon from someone and they only have quart capacity or a pint. Mm. It's not their fault. It is our fault for not recognizing that. So forgiving is huge. And that might be even a process. Yeah. You might say you forgive them today and be angry at them tomorrow. again tomorrow. So you have to keep confessing, I forgive this person. I release this person. If they were meant for me, every good and perfect gift comes from above. If that's the case, they would still be here. God knows something I did not. I'm releasing that person. And I'm opening myself up to the better that God has in store for me. Starting with a gratitude journal. Mm -hmm. Making note of what I am thankful for today, even while I'm in pain. So that the good begins to overtake. Love overtakes the darkness. Yeah. So that is where we land. You know, in nurturing a grateful heart. Uh, looking at the options that are before us. It's not over. There are many more opportunities for love. That one wasn't right, and I release it. Mm. I hope that that has been helpful. OK. So we're running out of time. Oh. I hope, ladies, are you enjoying the conversation? Yes. OK, we'll go on a little bit more. Um, let's talk about divorce. OK. Now, you know, we keep. You're not going to get me thrown out of church for this one, are you? No, 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 okay. no, 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 no. You know, we hear this. And it's true. It's in Malachi 2, verse 16. It's in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 15. God hates divorce. Mm -hmm. We know this. And to God, divorce is like a body being dismembered. Yes. Okay. So if you think about it, we come together as one flesh when we get married. And for those of us who are married, think about it. When you marry that person, you now sort of form relationships with their auntie and their uncle and their neighbor from wherever, their sister, their brother. So there are so many intricate relationships that you form because you are married to them. You don't even remember some of the relationships. So this is auntie so-and-so. Now just imagine when the divorce happens or the divorce is happening. And the reaction from all these different people, it is a painful process. I mean, my parents got divorced when I was 13. Mm -hmm. My mother is here. And they got married again to each other when I was 16. Mm. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> and when they were divorced, if you ask any of them, why they got divorced, they'll be like, I don't even know what happened. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah. And even when my parents were divorced, my mom was helping my, uh, my dad with his business. Mm. My dad was coming to my mom for help. <laughs> and it's like the friendship was still there. Mm -hmm. And they got married again to each other, mm -hmm. thank God. My mm -hmm. mom, she broke that cycle mm -hmm. because in her family there is divorce. Yeah. She broke the cycle for us. Mm -hmm. And I think that deserves a round yeah. of applause. You know, because we need, to, we need to break these generational cycles. You realize that in a household, everybody is divorced. All mm -hmm. your aunties are divorced. So something is going on. So divorce is a painful process. I know how we felt as children. I saw my dad drive out of the house the last time, and there were tears in his eyes. Mm -hmm. It wasn't easy. Yeah. And then his, my family members, some of them cut us off. Mm -hmm. Literally, they stopped. We didn't exist anymore, my sister and I. Mm -hmm. So, and then when my, my parents got remarried, they started creeping back in. Oh, after like four years. Oh, yeah. how are you? And I was like, you're a traitor, you know, mm -hmm. really. So divorce is a very painful process, and we know that God hates divorce. But what about when divorce is seeming like the only option mm -hmm. or seeming like the best option? Does God hate the divorcee? Mm -hmm. God does not hate any of us. But no. I want us to unpack this issue of divorce because there's a stigma around divorce yes. as well, mm -hmm. and it's almost like a taboo discussion. Mm -hmm. So let's unpack it. Mm -hmm. 
what to do about divorce. God hates divorce. Um, the Bible also lists a lot of other things that he hates. Yep. Yeah, you know, so uh, he hates lying tongues. He hates feet that run to do mischief. He hates, you know, a lot of other things as they're listed in Proverbs. So, uh, you know, I, I love how we specialize specific <laughs> sin. You know, yeah. homosexuality is a special sin. Divorce is a special sin. What about all the other sins? To God, sin is sin. He doesn't like any of it. He hates all of it. Because anything that separates us from him, he hates. Yeah. He does not. And, and let us get a definition of what sin is. Sin is anything that hurts you or hurts someone else. It hurts God's heart, but it doesn't hurt him. Mm. It hurts him to see you hurt. And that's why he asks you not to do specific things. Like a loving parent who tells a child not to touch a hot stove because he, it's not that he doesn't want the child to have the pleasure of touching the stove. He does not want the child to be burned. Mm. So let us understand the agenda for why God tells us not to do certain things. Yeah. Divorce is, is, is very painful for not just the couple. It, re, you know, it reverberates through the entire family, through children, blah, 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 blah. So that's why he doesn't like it. However, what he doesn't like more than that is anything that separates us and it disrupts our relationship with him. So now, if you've got a husband beating your brains out and you think God doesn't care, he doesn't like that. Mm. You know, he's not going to condone that. Michelle, also, apart from physical abuse, emotional verbal abuse, verbal abuse, verbal emotional abuse, abuse, financial abuse, financial abuse, all of these kind of abuses. Abuse. God says, if the husband does not treat his wife well, he will not answer his prayers. Mm. That's scripture. They don't tell you about that when they church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? So he considers him worse than an infidel if he doesn't take proper care of his family. So what we have going on here, when he says, you know, because a lot of churches, they get into, oh, you can't remarry, blah, 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 blah. I don't think God is as adamant about that as the church makes it. That is a control mechanism. Yes, divorce should not be your first option. It should be your very last option. But in some cases, he says, if, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Sometimes a person has to be cut off from your life mm -hmm. because they're not conducive to you containing, continuing to walk with God in the proper way or having the right mindset. Okay? So that is how God judges this. And he knows your heart of if you try to make it work or not. Mm. He knows if, if the guy was participating in the rebuilding process or not. So actually part of this is quite personal and private. Mm. And it's between you and God. God will give you the, the quickening in your spirit as to if you need to let this go or if you need to stay and work on it. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the bottom line. It's a very individual thing. But it is not, you know, nobody's going to hell for divorce. They're not. There is one unforgivable sin, and that is blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which is totally neglect, uh, rejecting Christ, okay? Anything else is forgivable. And there are, you know, there are, <laughs> there are divorced people who have remarried and have a much better marriage that glorifies God, you know? Um, but they did it the right way. Yeah. I will say that. Mm. So just be cognizant of that and not allow that to be something that drags you down or makes you stay in a situation that is hurting you, killing you, and depleting life from you. Thank you so much. Round of applause, please. So we're going to continue. One more question. And let me just yep. double, I want to reiterate that I, what I said. God got a divorce. That's so in true. Jeremiah, he wrote a, a letter of divorce against the, the country of Israel, mm. the nation of Israel, because they had been unfaithful. That's true. Now, we're all grafted into the same tree, so we'll be reconciled and be back to being one bride. But he also remarried. He remarried the Gentile nation. Mm. 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 So let, let put that in perspective for you. I'm going to go back and read all these scriptures to remind myself <laughs> yes. to refresh my knowledge. The, one of the last things we talk about is being unequally yoked. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells us light and darkness cannot mix. Right. If you have two different belief systems, you cannot marry each other. It's not exactly. going to work. Um, 
two cannot agree unless two cannot work together unless they, they agree. agree. So what do you do if you've already decided to marry your light and you've decided to marry darkness mm -hmm. and you are having a storm in your marriage mm -hmm. because you can't agree on anything, how to raise the children, you are fasting and he or she is saying, well, why are you fasting? Mm -hmm. You're always going to church or what have you. Or you're even two different religions, mm -hmm. people who may be Hindus marrying Christians or different faiths. You've already made the mistake. What do you do next? Well, Paul says, if the person doesn't want to leave, you should stay. And that uh, your conversation will sanctify your partner. That's not your verbal conversation. That's your lifestyle before that person. That now brings them into the life that you've chosen to live when it comes to your faith. If you can exemplify and represent God well in your home, your husband will be drawn into it, mm. which means you've got some decisions to make. Too many of us are religious. Mm. We have no flexibility in relationship. If he's resentful of you being at church all the time, don't be at church all the time. Make it an agreement. Let it be him releasing you to go to church. Okay, honey, what's comfortable for you? Because my faith is important to me. So I won't go every single night, but what would be comfortable for you? And then you agree to that. Now, somebody said, well, that, you know, now they're coming between me and God. No, God is at your house with you, isn't he? <laughs> what happened during lockdown? You found God at home, didn't you? Yes. Now, I'm not saying forsake the assembling of yourself together, but come to him in agreement. If he says, okay, Sunday is fine, but all this other stuff in between, I don't want you doing it, then you, you, you are to submit to your own husband. And while you're submitting, now that you're in the right position, you pray and ask God to change his heart. You know, recently, um, actually one of my relatives mm -hmm. was uh, married to a woman and it was a bad situation. And um, I said, well, you know, why don't you ask God to judge between the two of you and do what he will? The woman moved out, filed for divorce and left him. Wow. God released him. He didn't do anything. <laughs> he just prayed. We talk, 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 talk too much. Oh, what needless pain we bear, yeah. all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. God is concerned about your situation. When you get in the right position, you see, the, the, the thing here is about not giving that other person an excuse against God. It says we walk mm. in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You only want me to go to church on Sundays? Fine, no problem. I've got my prayer closet at home and I'll pray and I'll serve you and be a loving wife to you so that there's no argument about God. And then you'll see his heart start to soften and change because all he's trying to do is get control. And he feels like he's uh, in competition with God, in competition with the pastor. You know, you're removing all of that from the table. Now what's his excuse? Mm. And if all else fails, God will remove that person. In the case of Abigail, Abigail was married to a fool. Yes. Okay? She served him. She did all the right things. And God got rid of him and replaced the fool with the king. Mm. Sometimes he won't kill that person in your life, but he'll call the king out of them as you submit and do the right thing. The last thing we'll talk about is taking care of ourselves, but I want to invite the doctor from Yahoo. Today we want to talk about our health hub and what we do. The health hub is basically for screening purposes. Okay, that's the main thing. And I have, what I want every woman to know is that when it comes to medical screening, I'll stratify it into from 18 to about 40 years and from about 40 years to about 60 years. And then from the 60 years and above, so that we'll know what we are all supposed to know. And screening is not really for diagnosis, okay? What, when you want to do screening, what you want to do is to catch diseases that can be caught very early on. And diseases that when there's intervention, you are going to salvage the situation, save life, improve mortality, 
all the good things, okay, so it's not when you have a sickness that you want to do it. It's something, it's like a maintenance check, just like we do the pedicures, we do our facials. That's what screening is all about. Okay, so from um, what you have to know about heart health is that um, from age 18 to about 39 years, you need to at least have at least one BP check. Okay, sometimes when the people come to the hospital and I tell them, the, the, especially those on insurance, because insurance doesn't really cover screening. Okay, insurance, most of the time your deal is, they want us to treat you when you are sick and not when you come and demand. Because some people can demand for a check anytime, 24-7, if that's the case. And insurance is a business. So when you come to the hospital and you've had a BP check, you've gone through a screening, you want your BP to be less than 120 of systolic and less than 80 on diastolic. So between 20 and 30 years, at least, you should have one BP check. And if this BP check finds your BP to be 139 over 90 thereabouts, it means that at least every three years, every three years, you have to have a BP check throughout Throughout, at least, it means that if you don't have any business at all in a hospital, walk through and have a BP check every three years. Now, for cholesterol, from the 20 to 30 years, at least have one cholesterol checked. Okay, otherwise, every three years, you'd want to have a cholesterol check as well. And if your cholesterol is abnormal, you have more frequent checks, normally every six monthly and then you work with the doctor to know how best to have it controlled. Again, for diabetes, if your BMI, your body mass index is normal, from 45 years, you should have three yearly diabetic clearance as well. But if your BMI is not all right, from 20 years, you have to have a diabetic check. And we are talking about the fasting blood sugar, the glycated hemoglobin, the oral gluco glucose tolerance test. So there are about three tests that will make sure that you don't have diabetes and this should be done for you. Okay, for breast health, the current teaching is that the best time to have mammogram is from 50 to 74 years. Okay, but for those with a family history of breast cancer or a personal history of breast cancer, first degree relative, second degree relative, third degree relative with a breast cancer, you should have your breast check at least from 20 years. And there's something called the germline mutation. It's just a, an inherited mutation in the breast cancer gene. Those people, they tend to have breast cancers very early on. You should have a well-planned breast screening throughout your life. To the extent that we can even offer you the possibility of having your breast, both breast removed your ovaries removed and all that. It's all on case by case, but it shouldn't scare anybody. It's actually the best for you. Okay, now for reproductive health, we talk about the pap test or the pap smear. The pap smear, before you turn 24 years, you should be having every yearly. And then there's a <coughs> pap test and HPV, the human papilloma virus test. Okay, so from 30 years onwards, you should have, don't just have a pap smear, have both a pap smear and HPV every five years. Every five years, or then a pap smear alone every three years. That is how we screen for that. Mm. That will provide, that, that will protect you from cervical cancer. Mm. Also a chlamydia test, also yearly, before the age of 24 years, and each time you meet a new partner or your partner is indulging in very risky sexual behaviors, you should continue to have a chlamydia check every yearly. That's for reproductive. So a pap smear, a pap smear with HPV and then a chlamydia test. Then for bone health, it's normally for women above 60 years, okay? That what we do is the bone marrow density for women above 60 years. For colorectal health, that's for colon cancer. From 50 years onwards, you would want to have a periodic colorectal exams, about three yearly intervals. 
what you do is the fecal occult blood and other tests and a colonoscopy as well. So from 50 to 70 years. Then we recommend that everybody, at least from 20 to 30 years, have your eyes checked once. And then every four years, have your eyes checked as well. For the hearing as well, you have, wow. you have to do hearing at least well. every four years. Hearing as well. You have to have your hearing check as well. Mm -hmm. Because you may never know when you are being a nuisance to your family. They keep talking to you and <laughs> eh, 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 or yeah. you seem to be ignoring them as you age. You see. But That's if you've been having four yearly yeah, checks, you nice. know. Okay, now for immunization, you want to have tetanus every 10 years as well. And also for shingles, you'd want to, from 60 years onwards, you should start having, at least you should have a shingle vaccination. And then for flu vaccine, now for COVID, we are all being primed to have. But for the older, if you live outside the country or you go to America and all that, from 65 years, you should have flu shots yearly. So those are the packages. And when you come to Nyawo, Nyaho Health Hub, we are going to work with you and customize your, your screening requirement based on age, sex, risk factors, and all that. But at least we all know that every woman at every age, there are specific things to be done for you. So we we'll want to meet you and offer services to you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I just wanted to have the last conversation with Michelle, and this is about taking care of ourselves. So as a doctor said, we have to do all these screenings. But how do we take care of ourselves so we don't become bent out? That's a good question. I think that we're always on the verge of that. Mm. And um, so I, I, I really highly recommend creating a sense of routine in your life. And it takes a discipline to do that. You know, just as you tithe your first tenth to God at church, you need to tithe your first tenth of yourself, which means you make a space for your me time. You know, determine what that looks like. Don't over promise. You know, under promise and over deliver for yourself. Yeah. Whether it's your prayer time, reading scriptures. You know, I love you version because mm -hmm. it gives you um, plans that you can follow in case you don't know what you should be reading and so you just don't read anything at all. Pick a plan and it's, you know, it's got day one, day two, day three. So. You can literally have a scheduled devotional time. If that means you need to get up, you know, half hour earlier, just so you have, because when you center yourself, the rest of your day runs a lot more smooth. When you check in with God first and say, hi, God, Papa, I'm here. Any instructions for the day? There's a reason Jesus stole away in the morning. I think mm -hmm. he got himself centered. God probably said, oh, today is that day you're gonna meet the guy with the, with the pigs. Just tell the demons to go into the water. You know, I mean, because nothing surprised him. He was always prepared, right? Mm -hmm. So prepare your heart, prepare your spirit. And then make a list of everything you're doing and separate the necessary from the unnecessary. Because you cannot be all things to all people all the time. Mm -hmm. You'll end up being nothing to everyone. Mm -hmm. So really prioritize what is important. What's feeding me here? What's making me better for others? If this is draining me, sucking the life out of me, I need to get that off my list, right? Yes. So do a, a self-examination, write down, this is what I'm doing. I have a long list myself and I'm always saying, Lord, am I doing too many things? It seems like everyone else is just doing one thing yeah. and I'm doing 10 things, am I? But all my stuff is organic, it all feeds into each other and if anything becomes something I'm not enjoying, I quickly remove it from the list. Mm. You know, that's the sanguine part of my heart, but I think it's also spiritual. That, you know, <laughs> God says, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, right? He's promised you more joy. So if there's something that's, that's depleting that, it's an assignment he hasn't given. He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So if your yoke is not easy and your burden is not light, it means you've taken on an assignment that he didn't give you. Mm. So you need to figure out which assignment that is and get it off the list. Because the enemy, if he can't beat you, he'll join you. He'll just load your plate with stuff and have you feeling that it's all your duty. We don't do anything out of duty. We do it out of the motivation of love. 
to God and to others. Mm. And so if it's taking anything else away, get rid of it. Then take time. You know, for me now, I have to stretch every morning. Yeah. Even if it's just for 10 minutes. I have a program I found, actually, that's a seven-minute program. So I have no excuse not to do it. Mm. You see? Seven minutes. It makes a difference in your body. And trust me, as someone who's, you know, I'll be 65 now. I'm 64. I don't know why I'm leaping ahead. I think I just <laughs> like the number because I'll be able to get Social Security. Anyway. <laughs> but all I'm saying is take the time for yourself because the things your mama didn't tell you is when you don't take care of yourself early, you pay for it on the back yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. So use your eye cream at night. Uh, that was one she didn't tell me. You know, that, that keeps the wrinkles from coming here. Use your eye cream at night. You know, stretch every day. Your muscles and your bones will thank you for it. You know, drink water first thing when you get up in the morning. They're just simple things. Take your vitamins. Take your Very vitamins, important. you know. Um, eat clean. Oh, we, we like too much stuff that's, oh. It just clogs your pores and everything else. You know, eat clean. We live in a land where we can get fresh vegetables and fresh fruit. Don't take those things for granted. Enjoy them. Make smoothies. Clean your system out. If you're not regular, there's a reason for it. It means you're eating the wrong things. Mm. You know, so all of these things are things that you implement, and they become a part of who you are, and they become natural habits that sustain you. And you also look like 30 when you're 60. Yeah. Thank you. I think, I think the best, so in everything that you've said, the best form of self-care is time with God. Yes. He'll download the wisdom to you. You'll yes. be able to organize your day and everything will fall He'll in place. He'll tell you what to eat. He'll tell you everything you yes. need to do for yourself. Yes, 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 yes. So it starts there. Wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. Round of applause for Michelle, please. And I, I have think, books at the back table yes. and some sparkly... Uh, yes, I think I want to say thank you so much to everybody for coming. I want us to just say a quick word of prayer. Michelle, would okay. you just sure. pray for everyone? Yeah. Let's stand up, please. Father, thank you. Thank you for creating us to be the women that we are. Help us to see it as the gift that it is. Help us to see the power that you've deposited in us because of who you called us to be. Help us to celebrate and embrace it and to use it to be our, who we are as vessels of blessing to others. Help us to understand our job description. Help us to understand who you called us to be. Help us to rest in that calling, to celebrate it, embrace it, and utilize it for your praise and for your glory. Amen. And for those, Lord, that have been just on the fringes of their relationship with you, I pray by the Spirit of God that they would draw closer and go deeper with you, that they would discover the delight of being intimate with you, Amen. the passion and the joy that can be found in that space when they choose to embrace you completely and surrender their lives and all that they are to you. Amen. Father, help us all to be more effective in who you called us to be. Amen. Help us to live each day with a great sense of purpose. Help us to master the mundane and not just look for the magnificent. Amen. Knowing that in each step that we take, we are drawing closer to who you called and created us to be, to do a specific work that will bring glory to your name and help with the enlargement of your kingdom. Lord, all roads lead back to you. Mm. Help us to see the reality of that and to enjoy the journey. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, amen. Father, we want to thank you for everybody who has come here today, who has given their time. We pray that, Lord, as, even as we go, we speak words of blessing upon them. We declare that they will have a wonderful week. We prophesy blessings. We prophesy good things. We prophesy that they will walk in the knowledge of who you have made them to be and the power that they already have. Mm. That, Lord, they will realize and know that they have everything that they need deep inside of them and that Holy Spirit will empower them to call it out, bring it out, and bless everyone around them and the world with it as they walk in their purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Letitia Brown, would you please come please. up and accept your prize? Now, Letitia sponsored a lot of women to come here. Letitia sponsored 10 women to come here. And we're so grateful to you, Letitia. So here you are. This is your... Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Very much.
Thank you very much for everything you do and continue to do for us. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for participating in the quiz, asking questions. It was a very interactive session and we look forward to seeing you again. Uh, 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 uh.